Well, good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Fingers crossed. Okay, so um, welcome, welcome to everybody. Uh, appreciate you guys being here. Um, I'm assuming the numbers will go up a little bit. Um, we had about 200 plus people fill in that form. So I'm assuming these numbers are gonna go up and down um, as people get and, and figure this stuff out. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny because this wasn't the original intent. The original intent was kind of a more interactive Zoom uh, style lesson. Uh, but what happened was uh, my emails kept getting chucked into trash and spam for people so they weren't getting the links. Um, and then I didn't have enough space in my Zooms in order to accommodate the amount of people that were supposed to be coming. So I just went with this method, which I think is perfect because this will automatically back itself up onto my YouTube channel a um, couple hours after this is all done. So um, pretty cool to see people from all kinds of different cities in Canada and the US, it's awesome. Um, so a couple quick things, if you are new to, I guess I'll watch where I put this so I don't make a mess, um, which is new, uh, if you're new to, to me and this concept and, and all my weird wackiness here, um, what I'm just going to do is a couple little things before I start. So if you want, you can just take the URL to this meeting. So this is going to be like inception. This is going to be like stream inside stream inside stream. And if you take just the URL up here, um, you can copy and share this with anybody um, on your own social medias. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated just to increase numbers. I'm, you know, the more people who know about this, the better. And of course, it's totally free. So by all means, please do that. Um, just again, copy the URL, paste it anywhere. Um, and then I have a hashtag that I've created for our group of gamification teachers, um, which I'll get to in a moment. And then if you are brand new to me, um, I have a website, which is mrhebert.org. And when you go to um, my website, you are going to find that everything that I have is regarding gamification can be found all in this gamification tab. So I have a store, but don't let that fool you. Everything is free. I have the digital breakout website I've created, which again is there's a lot of work to be done there, but it gives you an idea of what things to do. Um, I've got the YouTube channel. I've got my TEDx talk stories, item badges, you know, all kinds of different things that we're all going to talk about today. And then I just wanted to point out that when you go to the store, this uh, folder you can download for free. And it is essentially everything that I've ever created over the past six years. It, it represents an, an ungodly amount of time and work and an effort. So it's all free for teachers anywhere that they want um, all around the world, because for me, it's really important to take the financial barrier out of education. And then I have my two books. Um, I have a blue one and a red one. I have Press Start to Begin, which is what this is today. And then I have um, something called Insert Coin to Continue, which is once you get, um, once you get um, sorry, I'm just trying to read the chat to make sure I'm not missing things and do this. So I'm going to get used to it as I go. Um, and then uh, insert coin to continue, which is more advanced once you start getting um, all of these different kinds of things good. So and, and comfortable with and then people say, well, why? Why are your resources free? Well, first of all, I used to charge for them it's because I needed to build my infrastructure. I needed to have my website and my tools and all my different kinds of things. And, but I didn't like the cost at what I had to sell it. And now that I finally got the infrastructure built, 
the whole program now is just based on um, donations. If anybody wants to, there's no, there's no need to do it. Um, some people have just asked to have the ability to do so. So I put it there because what the heck, who cares? Um, but my big, my big motivation and my big drive is to make sure that we take the financial burden out of education. And the thing that I find really frustrating as a teacher is a lot of us are, are expected to pay, you know, when, when things get clawed back and, and money becomes tight, especially as it is in certain provinces and states, um, you know, you got to pay for things out of your own pocket. And I think that it's just really good when teachers can share with each other and really support um, and bring all the different things together in this big melting pot of ideas. So that's kind of where I'm at. And that's kind of what I, I really believe in and something that I think is, is good uh, that we need to be doing uh, to support each other. So I'll get the slideshow up and feel free, take the resources, share them. Um, I'm always available for questions. People who know me know that I take the communication part seriously. I don't want to present ideas and disappear. So as you um, have questions and want to learn about different things, please do let me know. And then we will go from there. Um, as I start here, please know that we're on about a 10 second to 15 second delay on my end. So I've got my stream up and running that I'm watching on a second monitor for the chat. So um, if anybody has any burning questions, this is not like super formal, it's very informal. So if you have any questions, um, please jump on in and, and just ask me them as we go. Um, I'm, I'll go as long as people need to. Um, and you can feel free to, to dip out anytime you have to if you have other obligations. Because I myself have to do a few other things, obviously, for my own job later today. So here we go. So I call this press start to begin. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just to play on, on games, okay? Um, I'm just gonna get my... Oh. So, um, so again, my name is Scott Hebert. I would classify myself as uh, a big nerd, husband, father, teacher. And my social media that I predominantly use is gonna be my Twitter and my Instagram, which are both are found at Mr. Hebert PE. So if you would like, please feel free to follow those. I always try to put out content. It's not as prevalent right now due to COVID, um, but I try to be really active in, in sharing ideas, you know, not only my own, but with other people that have, you know, got ideas that I want to then go ahead and, and share ideas that they have shared with me out to the public. So I'm, I'm happy to be kind of a little communication tool for people if they want. Um, so again, the first question that I get all the time lately has been about leveraging, you know, Google Classroom to gamify your class. It is something you can do for sure, uh, especially now during COVID. The one thing that's really important to, to remember is that a good gamification doesn't just do points and the carrot on a stick. It, 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 and that's what I really want to do this presentation about is because this is going to go much more in depth than a lot of people who who realize I kind of take gamification from a very different approach than it was traditionally done years ago. And I've been finding a lot of success in going really, really in depth to that connection piece. So you can use things like Google Classroom as tools or supplementary pieces to amplify gamification. But what you want to make sure is it's not just a, a point reward system because those things will fade off over time to kids. Um, you know, most presenters show things about their family. So here's my little kiddos, my puppy, my wife. Um, she is a psychologist. So it's been really neat um, for a lot of people to, but for, for me, I should say, to learn some of the science behind what I've been doing that I, I just did out of natural instinct that I didn't know was actually this, this actual brain science <laughs> behind it, which has been cool. Um, being from Canada, this is winter in Canada. There's me and my little puppy. It is, um, it's cold where I live, <laughs> uh, but right now it's beautiful. So um, I love social media and I love the connection piece of social media. That's how I found so many different amazing educators all over the world where we've been able to bounce ideas off of each other. If you're not on Twitter, everywhere I present, I always say this, uh, say this over and over again, please do um, 
use sign up for Twitter, even if you don't contribute to it, use it as something to just soak up information. So if you want to tweet uh, during this presentation at me, just uh, at Mr. Hebert PE, um, which was the Twitter handle I created when I was a PE teacher, which I'll get to. And then I created the hashtag game my class, which is a pretty, pretty good and growing um, community of gamification teachers from all over the world who just share ideas with each other. Um, they're super reliable and amazing group. And there's a several of them here, which is cool. So uh, please feel free to check that out for sure. So here's the big point of the presentation. I find school to be very, very boring and the whole concept and premise of school to be archaic and massively outdated. And I think a lot of kids and a lot of teachers feel this way. It's, a, it's about being willing to take that step forward to create a bit of change. And I wanna be really clear that I'm not faulting teachers. I don't view it as teachers being the problem. I view it as the general idea um, of, of the system being broken. I view it of the, the entire system of education having not advanced with the times. And yes, we have technological advances. We have all these different kinds of things. The idea is I think it needs to have a true pedagogical, I don't even know if that's a word, um, approach to it and taking the ideas of uh, the society and the time we live in and moving them with education, not just saying, hey, we got new tech. So here's 50 more iPads for the classroom. Check it out. We're amazing. Um, you know, our school's the best. It's got to be that in-depth connection piece with kids because you can only do so much with technology before that too becomes boring. And that's kind of my big thing. My big thing is engagement. Um, I have no idea who said this, but I love it. And I think it resonates huge right now in 2020, um, which is, <laughs> that's good. It's good to know that it's a word. <laughs> um, if, if a child can't learn the way that we're teaching, maybe we should teach the way that they learn. And I find that school is often a punitive system of this is how I do it. Why aren't you doing it this way? It's your fault. Um, not mine, not the systems. It's, you need to adapt to this instead of us adapting to them, which I think is very much um, a system that needs to change in that regard. We need to be with the kids and connecting with the kids, not forcing the kids to um, not forcing the kids to feel bad for not being able to handle a system that was designed God knows how many years ago. Um, so as I explained earlier, I run mrhebert.org. Um, mrhebert.com used to be this, which was a terrifying art website. Um, and so when I went to buy mrhebert.com, it was taken and I found it was this and I wanted no association to whatever the heck this is. So I'm looking at it and I say, you know, please go to mrhebert.org. Um, this guy emailed me how I don't know. I'm assuming he went to mrheber.org and found my contact info and turned around and he asked me if I wanted to buy mrheber.com. And I told him that, you know, I had been redirecting people away from mrheber.com for about five years. So I'm good. So please don't go to mrheber.com. This is what it was last time I checked it. So it's just now become a junk thing. So, um, if you get this or this or anything like that, please don't, uh, no problem, Alistair. Um, please don't worry, I am .org. So the ultimate goal is you look like this dude at the end. That's always the face I like to use. I really enjoy this like goofy looking, mind blown kind of face we got going on here. I just want you to rethink education. I want you to rethink what it could be um, or what, what it, what it isn't. How about that? Okay. And gamification, you might watch this and go, mm, that's not for me. But the idea that I want you to get is how can you, you embed and embody things that you are deeply passionate and uh, about personally into your own teaching practices and into your own classrooms. You might love music. You might like art. You might like, you know, sports and things like that. How can you infuse those elements into your classroom to make it more engaging? So I'm not big on numbers. I am not a data driven person. And that is something that I am totally content with. But there are people, um, sometimes administrators, trustees, school boards, if you want to make a change in your classroom, they need, they need numbers. So, um, oh, there's a typo here. My grade eight population this year um, has now been about 500 kids who have gone through this program. And 
The idea behind it is that I see an average grade increase of about seven to 15% from grades eight, or sorry, grade seven, and then to grade eight where I teach. Um, we have an honor roll system like most schools. Ooh, excuse me. This uh, gamification has produced about 71% of my kids who get 80 or above, which is our honor roll status. And if you adjust that number um, to include 70 or above percent, it's about 84 to 85%. And the idea here is that this is obviously working because my numbers prior to this were about half. Um, I found kids were highly motivated, but not highly motivated for the right reasons, often through fear of teaching or discipline or teachers or discipline or reprimand from parents. And I wanted kids to really care. The cool part now is um, I've got kids who are graduating and who are explaining that they're going into the sciences after getting kind of a, a, a different approach and feel for it in grade eight and then wanting to pursue more deeper sciences um, as they proceeded in high school, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and at the end of the year, so if you want to like make note of, of things that you can do right in the meet, like immediately, um, one thing that I always recommend is as teachers, we have the ability or, or we're not the ability, we're required to assess students. Um, however, we very rarely give kids the ability to assess us truthfully. So at the end of the school year, I give kids a blank piece of paper and I just say, write me a report card. And it is funny. Um, and I say, you, you can write, you can literally write anything you want. It doesn't bother me. Like you can be as honest and raw as you want, both the good, bad, and ugly of everything that I've done as a teacher. And then I use that to grow over the summer and find out what I need to do, need to change and things I need to get rid of. So it's very, very important to give the kids the ability because that ability to have trust, um, is huge in a classroom and the ability to give the kids the, 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 the voice that they sometimes feel that they don't have in your classroom is really, really important. Um, in those report cards, I've seen comments such as, you know, this is the only reason I come to school. This is the only class where I feel like I can be creative. Um, and then the big quote at the bottom here is, is one of my favorite quotes ever. And it is from a student who had an ISP or IPP or IEP or whatever they're called now. I think they're ISPs. And when they did this, they had uh, some issues with socializing and anxiety and the, their EA and the student were very apprehensive about this approach. And I said, you know what, let's just work through September. And if we have to make modifications, we will. And um, this was what he, he pulled his EA aside and said, can you write this down for me? And, and she started scribing everything he wrote. And that's exactly what he wrote. And I'll, I'll keep it forever because prior to that, trust, group work, teamwork, none of that existed with this student. He was very worried and, and apprehensive about everything. And he totally fell in love with the concept and the, and the idea of this. And he blended it um, into creating friendships and things uh, with him that lasted for a while, which I thought was pretty cool because it was a totally different way of thinking that got him out into more of a comfortable area in the classroom, which uh, I'm super happy. So I love seeing these kind of, you see different levels of success and different kids in different ways all the time through gamification. So what's the plan for today? I'm gonna to talk about why I think the education system needs a change, um, the solution, how I did it, and then some Q&A. And again, of course, Q&A, like by all means, go ahead and, and have a go at Ooh, me. have it going as much as you need to throughout the presentation. So what's wrong with school? Well, um, those of you who see me present know that I love this quote. There's a bit of um, controversy to whether he actually said this or not, um, but he said a version of this to some capacity anyway. And essentially it says, if we teach today as we taught yesterday, we rob children of tomorrow. And I think that my, my big issue with education is that this sits in the background of saying, well, because we did it this way, well, let's just keep doing it that way because it's been working. The idea is, I would argue that it's not been working because some of our biggest movers and shakers and innovators um, in the world and in history have had a huge disdain for education and said how stifling it was to their creativity and how they wanted to change and get out of school in order to pursue their passions in their own ways. And I think that that's a really powerful thing for kids to, to understand um, 
in the sense that you want to make sure that they are feeling as if the education system and their education is advancing with them and allowing them to be creative and adaptive to the environment that they live in. I mean, look where we are right now with COVID. It's an environment and an idea that is, you know, talked about in, in books and movies and all of a sudden we're living it out with this isolation and these, you know, these fears and these different ways of living. So we have to, we had to adapt our education to it, right? By shifting to this online platform. So the idea is we should be able to do the same thing in class when conditions are ideal. Um, kids view school as prison. This is why I use this um, all the time. And one of the reasons I like it is because I'm fortunate enough, I have three brothers um, and one of my brothers is a jail guard. So I showed him this and I covered all of this information uh, side note, how wicked is this presentation tool, right? And I covered this information and I said, what are we describing with these bullet points? So he took a second and he read them and he goes, yeah, that's how you run a prison. And I was like, yeah, that's also how a lot of schools run schools or how students perceive schools as being run. And in that regard, what happened is we had this this notion and this discussion of how much discipline and issues do you have with people in prison and how much disruptions and respect versus disrespect do you have when these are the things that they perceive, well, what would I expect a child to expect um, in these exact situations? So things like an authoritarian structure and things like that yeah, that, and that's a really interesting point, Sandra. Like that's how kid, like kids view these things in such a different way, right? They relate to what they see in TV and the movies and, and books and things like that. And they look at it in that capacity. And it's a really powerful way for kids to look at it. So when I look at things like dress code and walking in lines and, you know, whatever, that's fine. That Those things, you know, we can argue those on another day. The thing that caught me was authoritarian structure, negative reinforcements, abridged freedoms, no input on decision making. Imagine someone came into your class and said, you know, you are doing this, this and this, you have no choice. This is how it's going to be. And goodbye. That's how kids feel, right? And we wouldn't enjoy that as a teacher. I mean, you guys are here right now. Hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming here with the approach of you know, how can you change up your own uh, pedagogy or practices or, or, you know, little bits and pieces of, of, you know, activities or ideas for your own classrooms. Imagine not being allowed to do this. Imagine not being allowed to, to explore these avenues because you're told it has to be a certain way. And that's kind of the idea that I want to pull um, in this presentation is that it's okay to think in a different way. Um, if you want to look at books and things, if you are a reader, there's three books that I recommend. The first one in the middle here, um, this is called Spark, and it's by John Rutte, and it is essentially, um, it is essentially known as the Bible for phys ed teachers. So one of the things that I like is is movement. Um, my Twitter and stuff is Mr. Heber PE because I started my career as a PE teacher, and I'll get to that more in a second. But this was one of the first books I read, which changed my way of thinking about the brain and brain development based on exercise. So um, it's a fantastic book to read about how important exercise, physical activity, uh, movement is for the brain. Um, and it's cutting edge research at its time. It's, it's really cool. It's a great book. The second one is Play by Stuart Brown. And when you look at that, Play by Stuart Brown talks about the importance of play in kids. And the important part about that is to understand how it has growth. It has collaborative effects. It has both positive and negative effects based on how much or how little that you get. Um, and it's a really good book. He's one of the people who is credited. And don't quote me on this. I always make this mistake. Um, but I believe he's credited with creating a form of play therapy as well. Um, so it is, it's a very cool, really uh, interesting book. And he founded what's called the National Institute for, for Play, which is the idea about how you can take um, the importance of play and ensure that it exists in different capacities for kids. Um, and then the third one is called Free to Learn. And it essentially, so Peter Gray is a guy who hates traditional education. 
like his idea is to just take kids and chuck them into the woods and whoever comes out is like hey you survived and you get it and whoever didn't yeah well you know you didn't um and he he has the idea of unschooling and these unique different schools and designs um and while like i'm not jiving 100 percent with all his ideas i love his importance and the emphasis of play and the research that he uses to pull it and again, I'm not a research heavy data driven person. I just like to talk to the kids and interact with the kids and find out the good, the bad and the ugly from exactly their perspective. Um, the idea here is that um, if you have people who challenge your ideas and thinking these books are fantastic to pull just research thoughts and ideas. Um, I noticed in the chat, I got a couple people mentioning that they teach kindergarten. Um, a cool thing to do, uh, there's a wicked book for kindergarten teachers called All, uh, Even Bad Guys Have Birthdays. And it talks about how play structures and forms for kindergarten. And it's a really, really cool book. Sounds good, Catherine. Um, and the idea here is that this book talks about the importance of play in kindergarten. And then you hear some districts around the world who are trying to remove play from kindergarten in favor of structured stations and ordered learning. And it's like, eh, you know, a four or five year old kid is not ready for that type of learning at all. Um, again, if, if you're data driven, um, this crazy looking chart essentially goes like this. It says, uh, we got the research, we got the country. What are they looking at? So things like attitude and enthusiasm, interest, motivation, those kinds of things. How many people they studied and was it longitudinal or transversal? Um, and then essentially the check mark is where they started monitoring the kids. And then the down means the variables they're looking at. So in this case, attitude and enthusiasm went down and then remain the same. Here, for example, 192 kids in the US interest in, oh, by the way, this is science and technology because um, this is what I teach. So I wanted research to back what I taught. But when you look here, they followed kids starting before school and they found that the first three years of kids schooling, kindergarten one and two, their interest in science and technology had dropped every single year. That's a pretty powerful tool, a pretty powerful um, say about school uh, and what it's doing to kids. And as you look at this, you can see we've got studies upwards of almost 2,000, 3,000 kids. And if you look here, interest and attitude in Taiwan, they go across, decrease, decrease, stay the same. Um, Turkey, motivation, you have decrease. Like this one is telling right at the bottom here, you know, decrease for four or five straight years. There's only two instances where interest increased. Um, and other than that, kids weren't finding a disdain and an issue with school actually impacting their motivation. Then people started to study, you know, is this a thing that occurs throughout all of life? And what they found was, and this is, this was the, the light bulb moment for me. When I started my career, this is what I mentioned before. I started as a phys ed teacher and the school I taught in was in Calgary, Alberta. And it was kindergarten to grade 12. And you could see kids in kindergarten and elementary school where I was the K to four phys ed teacher. You could see kids just super amped about school, super pumped about it. They go to music, they're singing, they're dancing, they're going crazy in phys ed. They're telling me about all their science experiments and all these math and facts that they learned and everything like that. And then I would see them in middle school. And then that interest and enthusiasm would begin to drop. And then in high school, it would drop. And then even by following certain people all the way to the workplace, on average, three out of every 10 people are not feeling engaged by, by their uh, school or their jobs. They're just there grinding it out. And that engagement factor is such a massive piece to kids because when they are engaged, people always say, well, you know, I have this PD or this book or this idea about classroom discipline and management. Well, there's no silver bullet to it, but the most successful thing Isn't it right, Jennifer? That's exactly what it feels like. It's almost like you're you're more odd to appreciate and enjoy your job than it is to not. Like statistically, you're a, you're an anomaly in that camp, in that sense. Um, um, so thank you for that. But as I was saying, oops, um, what I realized is that when you when you take the the level of engagement, you boost up your classroom discipline and management without ever having to address it. So when the kids are into the task that you're doing and into the challenges, they're not going to be bored, therefore causing distractions, you know, whatever, improperly using technology, you know, chucking things into your ceiling, talking and bothering and leaving the classroom a hundred times. All of those things fade away because they want to be in the experience that you create. Um, 
th this I know that this is one of my favorite pictures ever. Um, a mom took this and blogged it years ago. And I know that there's so many different factors. Um, but if you look at it, this was the her, her son on the first day of school in kindergarten, and he was so pumped up and so fired up and, and so excited. And she, you know, she took his picture on the first day, like all parents do. And then on the second day, this is what he looked like. And I understand fatigue and, you know, and, and the energy drain and all the, you know, the, the crash after the super excitement of school, but this is how kids feel. They start with the impression and the notion that school is going to be this incredible, amazing place. And then it, it ends up not meeting those expectations. And then kids are kind of like, Meh, you know, and defeated about it. So my whole challenge to myself when I started doing this is can I can I turn the sleeping board I don't like this kid into whatever this is now I always tell this story because this this always cracks me up when I when I google image I love to use google image just to you know see what the internet believes about things and what are the most common search results for things and when I, when I looked at kids dislike school, kids hating school, you know, there's just thousands upon thousands upon thousands of entries of, you know, memes and, and photos and all these you know, negative connotations and things towards school. And then I searched kids liking school and I got the, uh, you know, Dawson's Creek. I got the, um, you know, saved by the bell type show of, you know, these 19 or 25 year old people pretending to be high school kids. Like, you know, what, what person in their right mind sits in a field like this, you know, all looking at a book, cheering into the air as, you know, this person reads a page or whatever the heck is going on in this picture. And when you look at it, it was actually hard to find genuine, enthusiastic pictures of kids excited on, about school on the internet, which is an in, infinite place of, of information and, and stuff. So it was like, wow, we have such a negative view of education by so many different people. So when we go to solutions, um, I like this quote simply because it really embodies what I'm going to challenge you to do today um, and, and from here on out. Whew, excuse me. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's the thing, Alistair, is you're going to start seeing people dislike technology this is the perfect avenue when school returns to that that you know normal whatever normal will look like face to face when you can break that bind with technology and do these things face to face with kids and that interaction and that group work it's going to change a big portion of how of of your classroom and you're going to get the buy in from parents and kids because kids are effectively going to be teched out when we get them again back in classroom um, so thank you for that. When you're looking at this quote, here's why I like it so much. It says, man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. So listen, and this is my, my challenge to you. This was by a playwright years and years ago, who I guess, and I'm not too familiar with him, but I did some research on the quote. And it, he said that as he, you know, and he's a playwright and his plays were kind of, you know, respected and enjoyed for their creativity and ingenuity. And he said this when asked about his ideas. What I'm asking and challenging you to do is as a teacher, we're often on this little island. And as you're sitting on this little island, you know, we build our little house and our shack of our lesson plans and our ideas and things that work. And then next year, instead of adding to that island or even going out to find another one, we're like, I'm just gonna, you know, lay in the same bed and I'll eat the same, food for breakfast, meaning you're going to use all the same things on that island. He was good at being a playwright because of his creativity and his risk taking. So the challenge is with gamification, swim away from your island, you have a stable base that you know is going to be fine. You know that works, you know, you've tried it, you're familiar with it, you're comfortable with it. So swim out into the middle of nowhere and find a new island and plant a new flag and try a new thing whether it's small scale, large scale, medium, whatever you're comfortable with. And as you get to that island and you start to establish, you now have two things that you can do. You can do things from island one and things from island two. And guess what? If island two burns down to the ground, you can swim back to island one and go back and then replant it. And the thing is, I totally agree, Ryan. Um, 
there are other avenues to do online gamification by using different sites and, and technology aside from Google Classroom. And I totally agree with you. A visual appeal to kids is important. Um, so sorry, I'm going back and forth between the chat and this. But anyway, keep that in mind today. I want you to try to pick at least one idea. And as you pick that one single idea, that's where you're going to build your new island. Okay. That's where you're going to start adding something new, knowing that you've got your house to go back to. It's all right. It's like a vacation. Pick it that way. Um, so every year the World Economic Forum meets and they talk about, you know, leadership and education and all those different kinds of things. And as they said, these are the top 10 skills we need in the business and, you know, working world, you know, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, active listening, service operation, negotiation, cognitive flexibility. When you look at that, do you believe, and I, I don't, I'm very honest about this, that a traditional model of education allows for these things to appear. And I would argue that it does not. And that's the scary part about it is that if you want kids to be creative and be good at negotiation or have higher levels of um, emotional intelligence, our, is, is our education system and curriculums and pressures of being a teacher allowing you and I to accomplish these tasks? And my argument is that it's not. Our argument is that standardized testing and different levels of assessment that are required kill a lot of these things in kids. So when I designed my gamification program, these were the things that I took into account um, for all of the, the things that I was designing. So um, long story short, what happened was I talked and interviewed some kids before I, I did my gamification and they gave me themes. And then I took those themes and I started plugging them into books into the internet. And I kept coming to this thing in business and marketing at the time. So this would have been what it's 2020, so 2014, I started this process so about six years ago. And I kept learning about this thing called gamification that again was heavy in business and marketing and things like that, but it wasn't really big into education. So I was like, mm, I'm going to have to tread a little bit of new ground here. And what it meant was it was a simply the idea of using game design elements in a non-traditional setting. So it meant using the concepts that make games replayable and addictive and fun and enjoyable and fostering creativity and all those awesome things. Because if you look, games do this, right? Games make you do this. So I went to this and I said, okay, I, th I think I can do this. And then I started doing some research and I realized that this is where gamification lives and dies for a lot of teachers. Okay. So tip number two is to not just do this. So a lot of teachers will, will hear me as I talk and we, we look at them and we say, okay, I do have gamification in my classroom. I would say, here is my sticker chart and the kids get stickers when they, you know, I always use this example, you know, they, they pick up garbage in the field. So they see a piece of garbage blow and they show me I'm on supervision, you know, I'm a recess guard and they come around and they say, you know, look, I've, I've got some garbage here, throw it in the garbage. And then they go into the classroom and they get a sticker. And eventually kids will stop picking up garbage because we're like, I don't care about these stickers anymore. So then the second thing occurs is the teacher goes, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take um, the difference stickers and say, once you earn, you know, five stickers, you're going to get the golden sticker, for example. And that golden sticker might represent, you know, what we call a badge, a progressive marker that you can achieve by completing a specific type of task. And that'll work for a few kids. But again, that motivation, that interest will die off. Then you go to your leaderboard where you actually go up and down the list and as you go up and down the list, you're going to realize that kids start looking at the leaderboard and they're like, I'm never going to have as much stickers as that kid. Mm, I don't like this. And then eventually the whole system just dies off because each element expires. Okay. I would say it's like food in an expiry date. So when you're thinking about gamification, don't view it simply as the a concept of carrot on a stick and being like, you know, here's some experience points or here's a game card or here's some gold or something for completing said task. If that's the only point of emphasis you're gonna have, it's gonna fail and it's gonna die. 
yes, sorry, Alistair. Yeah, we do have the um, them built into our curriculum, and we actually have a new, more modern set coming out. I think this year. Um, now, the funny part is when you talk about games and gamers, you get this stereotype um, right here, and I, I have a very different view about these pictures. If you were to replace a gaming system with a textbook or a calculator, and this is the level of dedication that your students had, and they looked like this, you know, these were calculators and textbooks and pens and papers, they were that fired up about school. Would this picture have the same negative connotation um, as the expectations of gaming? And it wouldn't, you would be on the cover of Times Magazine and you would be losing your mind with interview requests because if kids were this dedicated to your program, it would be really, really hard for people um, to, you know, I don't know what that says, really hard for people to, to argue that it works. So what you see here is massive levels of dedication. That's what games bring, okay? And we can prove this with a little bit of data as well. And then I'm noticing on the chat here, we're talking about leaderboards. Um, if you look on my YouTube channel, I have a video about building your own gamification app. And that gamification app, um, I already have a template built for it that will automatically um, create your leaderboards based on teams and uh, individual players as well in it. And it's on an app for kids. Because it's a web-based app, you will not have to worry about um, anything happening in terms of kids having specific devices or tools. It can be used on Chromebooks, phones, iPhones, Androids, doesn't matter. It can be used on everything. So, yeah. Because um, I have heard people say that sometimes it's a bit overwhelming because it's this giant Google sheet of information that's like really, if, if, you're, if you're a bit intimidated by it. So um, this app is, is another idea that you could use for sure. Um, and again, because you create it on your own, you have full creative control over it. Um, now we break down games. The average age of a gamer is 33. And that's probably roughly the average age of the people in this chat room, okay? So good question, Alistair. Do leaderboards demotivate players? It has, it has the ability to demotivate them. Yes, I'm talking about Glide apps, yes. Um, it has the ability to demotivate people and um, it's one of those things where if you don't design it properly. So when I get to leaderboards later on, there is a way that you can use what they call the, the blue turtle shell mechanic um, where you can bring people from the bottom up to the top or give people special powers at the bottom to go up to the top and different things like that. So you can make it um, a bunch of different strategies to make leaderboards work better. But if, yeah, if it's one annual leaderboard that never changes, you're going to have your runaway kids and then you, it will demotivate. So again, everything's got kind of that yin and that yang, that pro and that con, if it's not designed properly. But again, this uh, don't be afraid about making mistakes in gamification. I'm six years in and I still make mistakes all over the place. It, it's all about a work in progress. It's, it's like a game creating beta updates. You're going to learn how kids view your game and then you're going to update it and then you're going to update it. So it's never like a, a, an etched in stone. This is how it's going to be forever type approach. Um, I did the glide app thing this spring as prescription, but it certainly would not. Follow. Yeah. So it doesn't auto populate all the time. You have to put a few controls in. Um, so I can help you with that later on Heather, if you have any ideas. Yeah, it, design is so important in gamification. It, it's, it's more in depth than people realize it is, hence why I like to do this. Um, anyway, so real quick here, um, you know, the average age of gamers being 33, average age, you know, amount of time that they've been playing is about 14 years. And you look at this, 21% are under 18, but 40%, the biggest population of games are between 18 and 34. And when you really think about that, that's us. That's the predominant age bracket right now, okay? Then you go 36 to 49 and you're at 18% and 21%, the same amount of people who play under 18 or over 50. 
And that's because of motion-based gaming and pocket gaming. This is the thing that's changed the world in terms of gaming because you no longer need to go out and buy a gaming system. What you can do is you would really simply just look and you would turn and you would look and you would say, you need an expensive gaming system. Well, we don't have enough money for that. Now with these phones, they're not just simple little, you know, snake games and craziness. What they show is incredibly detailed, high, high impact, high motivation games. So it's changed. And then people go, well, oh, girls won't like this. Actually, girls will massacre people. They are so good in a gamified environment because it allows them to take different roles that they often don't see in the traditional classroom. It forces them to work with people that they don't like. They're super competitive. And all these stereotypes, that they won't enjoy it, they won't like it. They won't, it's such nonsense. The, it's almost a 50-50 split in the gaming world. Girls are more than capable of this. And year after year, my winner of most XP, biggest contributions, all those things, is often a female student, which I think speaks volumes to the fact that we have to stop having this, this negative connotation towards girls and games it's it's 2020 it is it is not anything that people um will need to to change and do um i'll be right in just one minute please feel free to take a break as well i just have to go uh, see my son he's calling me for one quick second Oh, I love this. Look at this chat exploding with so many ideas. I'm just going to take a peek here before I start. Okay, so I want to hit this real quick. So Joanna said, what about gamifying education in an environment where technology use isn't an option? I'm going to talk to you about that. I'm a massive proponent, massive proponent of face-to-face -face interactive, limited to no technology. And I've actually roped it into my game in a way that kids don't fight me for not having technology. And I'll kind of explain to that through a skill-based system. But I'm... Everything I do almost is face-to-face, non-digital, because I want to take the reliance off. I use a digital environment like um, Eric is explaining here, where the, da the data tracking is done through an app or a spreadsheet or you know whatever tool you prefer digitally, but the entire game runs face-to-face, -face, um, which is cool. So it is something to definitely check out. And I'm liking this. We got people from all different grades, all different areas, all different subjects, which is awesome. Cool. All right, so back at it. When you look, the gaming industry is a money-making machine. It, it nearly doubled its revenue in four years from 2014 to 2018. So it is incredible. Um, and oh, I do use big time elements of game of uh, D and D in my classroom, despite the fact that I have never played one D and D game ever. Yeah. So the, the issue that we're in right now, Melissa is, is not knowing what's going on next year. Um, we don't know when school will return, what it'll look like, how many kids we're going to have, what limitations. There's so many uncertainties 
that exist right now in, in the education world that digital might have to be a little bit used a little bit more than I would have a personal preference with. But definitely, I would say when things return to some sort of normal and you've got kids in your class, being able to break it down and have that non-digital analog face-to-face interactive challenge, run around the room, doing things physically is the best way to apply gamification for sure. Um, yeah, tech, tech becomes a, su- a support tool or a supplementary tool towards the different kinds of things. Um, here's a little statistic you can chuck in newsletters to parents who challenge your thinking and your idea. Um, is if you look, about 74% of parents, when polled, believe that you were to look uh, into, gamific- into games, it could actually have an educational purpose. Um, let's see here. I got a question, Scott. Got a little on a level of one to 20, who would you say that you incorporate the work of Gary Dirks or David Hansen? Um, I actually have not used a lot of their thinking. At least I don't think that I have. What I've done is I use Andre Merzewski. I'm about to talk about that right now, actually. Um, Andre Merzewski, as well as, and I'm saying his name wrong, and Yukai Chu and their ideas about gamification. And I've created a lot of the elements at least I think I have myself by just by by talking and communicating with kids so I am not um 100 sure I am using either of these people but I'm going to do a quick copy paste of their names um to learn more and I might inadvertently be using their things without knowing um but I will I will get back to you on that um if you want to put an emphasis on why play is important. This is one of my favorite research quotes ever. So um, Dr. Karen um, Purvis, Purvis, I'm not sure how to pronounce that to be honest, um, is when you look at, uh, oh, by the way, I guess you say she was a a neuroscientist and psychologist, I believe, and into, you know, the human mind. And she found that play is so important in synaptic connections in the brain. 400 repetitions to create a new synaptic connection, unless you do it via play in which it's 10 to 20. So think about that. You are saying, you know, I'm not a math guy. I don't know, like 3 billion percent increase. I'll just like to use big numbers and make things up. But, you know, we're looking at an incredible increase in efficiency and capacity of learning. When you look with that synaptic connection of getting that, that, that roadway built in the brain where things move and, and shake a little bit faster and process a little bit quicker, play is physically proven to do that in the brain, which is why my emphasis for play in the classroom is so important. People view play, if you're playing, you're not learning. And it is so counterintuitive to even suggest that um, because data proves that play is linked directly to learning. If you were to talk to kids about how they view school, um, they would have a bunch of different opinions. If you were to ask a school, a building of a school to talk, what you traditionally have people say, and we all have this as teachers, you know, you meet someone new, hi, what do you do? Oh, I do this, oh, I'm a teacher. Oh, they have all these opinions, right? Kids, how do you do this? Their kids are lazy, they're not dedicated, they're, they're, they're uninterested, blah, blah, blah. And Yeah, of course they are. When you look at a traditional education system, I think that there's a lot of people who struggle with that idea. But when you look at school, um, it is one of the things that a lot of people don't realize school is a system designed to focus on loss. And what it means by that is that as you have a focus on loss, kids understand that the stressors are not about growth, but they're about loss prevention. And that's not what school should be about. School should be about growth and emphasis. But if you ask a kid on day one of school, their grade is going to be a good old 100%. And then you're going to get their first assignment and test and they get 90% on both. Well, that's going to mean that to a kid, 100% is no longer attainable, because you've now lost from your 100 percentage pool down to the 90 So your grade might be 98 or whatever, who knows? And based on that, kids are going to look at the emphasis of what they didn't get and not what they learned. 
But if you ask a game, if you know, you were to, I'm playing this weird Western cowboy survival game or whatever. If you were to ask that game that's on my phone, what is, what is Scott like? You'd say he's super resilient. He's super dedicated. He's got high levels of interest, high levels of motivation and, and effort because I want to do well. And I'll show you the psychology behind it in just a moment. But games focus on growth. So when I started, I was some random nobody cowboy, you know, walking around the old west and I'm a nothing. And then I, I come across people who are getting a uh, stagecoach robbed and I save them. And, you know, I get some items and I get some reprimand. And yeah, exactly right, Jennifer. You don't want kids to be afraid to try in a classroom or to worry about their grades. Um, and that's why I like games because games focus on growth. After I saved the stagecoach, they give me a couple of weapons, I get a new hat and they're like, well, you did really good. And it's like, boop, you leveled up. That's going to release shots of serotonin in your brain, which literally is the happy chemical. And this is where the draw of games come back. They turn around and these games are constantly saying, hey, you did something. I see that really, really good. Boop. Hey, really, really good. Boop. And all of a sudden kids, um, kids are so, well, human beings want to feel acknowledged, seen and rewarded. And that's exactly what games do continuously, because if they didn't, you would get bored and then you would not want to play them. The one thing you got to remember about school is we have to go to school legally. You have to go to school. Okay. As a kid to some capacity, whether it's homeschooling, whatever you have to have an education at some sort games, you, you would never ever have to play a game in your life. So games are designed in which to hook you and keep you intrigued with the process, even though you have to have zero dedication and effort into that. Yeah, I love the happy chemical. You got to love serotonin. You should do way more signs to add to the experience and get a great 100% personal life. I don't do that much work. Um, yeah, so what Brant is saying is a lot of kids will want to do more. And I'll talk about how I do an XP pooling system, but it, it's all of those things um, where you have the ability to take things that work in games and they translate very easily into classes. Um, um, yeah, okay, so I see all these grading things. I'm gonna come to that when I get to XP, but these are great questions that I see going up. So here's a little thing that I wanna be really clear about. Gamification is not game uh, experience point, Sandra. Um, it's a different way of grading. Um, so it's not game-based learning. So here's, here's my experience and my vantage point of this. Gamification means we do a total revamp and reinvent of everything. You give it layers and depth and all kinds of different things. When you look at game-based learning, game-based learning is playing a particular game to learn a particular skill and that's it. That game is gonna only go with one particular skill or idea and that's all it's gonna teach you. If you're a math teacher, a fun one to check out is the game called Dragon Box because the game Dragon Box is actually a well-designed game to teach kids about algebra without ever having telling them that they're learning algebra. That's what a true game-based design looks like. A game-based um, program that teaches you a skill that's overtly showing you you're doing a skill, a lot of research proves doesn't work. So for a lot of us here, one of our first educational experience games is your um, Math Blaster, um, type of game where you're just looking at a formula on the, on the computer. And instead of writing the answer, you know, five plus five is 10 on a paper, you're punching it in on the keyboard. It's not teaching you strategy or skills or anything. It's literally just saying, instead of writing 10 plus, you know, five plus five equals 10 on the, um, paper, punch it in on the keyboard and a laser will shoot up and blow up an alien ship that doesn't teach kids how to add. It teaches kids how to find patterns because primitive educational games worked a lot on patterns. The same way like Pac-Man, each ghost would work a specific pattern in order. So it's really important to understand to not go, um, oh, well, there you go. I do definitely use some of their ideas then for sure, Cronus. Um, I am just not 100% sure <laughs> how many of them, but that is awesome. Very good to know. Um, so I feel bad not knowing that now. I don't know the father of modern RPG gaming. Oh, that's a fail. Yeah, I learned something. Um, so you want your game to always 
be a little bit masking in its learning, not like super overt, this is what we're doing, but that little layer of, of masking and hidden uh, works really, really well. So let's go about all the different things about how this works. Here's the science um, work. So what's called human focus versus function focus. And this is, a, this is one of the, the more important things um, that is really cool. Yes, I will have to have a good chat with you, I think, at some point. Um, Octalysis by Yukai Chu was probably one of the more important books that I've ever seen and read because this was number one in my design of my classroom, which was hitting the core drivers. These are the eight ways that Yukai Chu found out we are motivated um, and essentially, yeah, all humans are motivated. And it's what he called human focus versus function focus. So the really simple way to look at it is if I ran a fac factory and all, all 50 of you we're sitting here in my factory and we had to build 50 computers and oh that's good to know Jim thank you I've, I've heard I've you know I I might be a little bit I've always wondered if I was a little bit you know drawn to this just because of what I do but that's really good um, that would be awesome um, so when you look at this um, for the motivation factor function focus would be I need all 50 of you here to build 50 computers at the end of the day. I don't care that the way you have to bend down hurts your back. I don't care that way you got to reach is tough on your shoulders. I don't care that you need two people to do a task. I'm making you only have one. It's all about the system, not about the individual. Human focused, uh, it is called, I will show you, oh, get my arrow across. It is called, um, well, I'm a bonehead, there we go. Uh, it is called Octalysis. And it's by a guy named Yukai Chu. So this is one of the, the pioneers of gamification. Essentially, he had an okay job, but he found that people around him weren't motivated. And he actually quit his job and started this company, this business, and this idea of motivating people, you know, to actually truly be into what they're doing versus just, you know, maybe, for example, doing it for money. So um, as we look through this, his idea is human focused, and he calls these the core drivers. These are the eight people, no problem. These are the eight um, modes in which you can find people to be influenced in different manners. And so I guess tip number three, if I'm counting in my head correctly, when you are designing gamification, you got to hit different types of people. You can't just say, this is the umbrella for everybody. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. What you want to do is you want to motivate everybody across, you know, the different levels and ways that they can be excited. So here's how they work. And here's, and I'll give you examples of how they're in at every one of my classes. So we have epic meaning and calling. This core driver means that you're participating in something bigger than you, something that you might not be able to achieve in reality. So for example, a lot of games have the premise of the world is ending, you can save it. You know, you got to make this basket to win the championship. You got to, you know, stop this bad guy or he's going to, you know, kidnap your family, whatever. It's a big overarching theme and story that creates the connection piece between the user and the game. So if you look now, what are the more popular settings on sports games is create a superstar or get drafted and become, you know, the next Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky or whatever. So it's actually, you know, I know damn well, I think I'm an all right basketball player. Yeah, act actionable gamification, octalysis. Yes, I always, I always screw that up. Thank you, Bobby. I always mess that up. Um, I was <laughs> See, that's why I need you guys here. Um, so the most popular thing in sports games now is, yeah, like I was saying, I think that I'm a decent basketball player, but I am nowhere near anything past grade eight versus grade eight kids and teachers games once a year. I'd never play and be more successful anywhere else, but I can buy NBA 2K20 and I can become a guy from the street courts who progresses all the way up and becomes this champion and then an MBA and blah, blah, blah. So to do this in my class, I created stories and I created narratives, which I'll get to more specifically, but the idea of my classroom being a, a thing where they're heroes saving me and then the people along the way that they meet, that they help and save. The next one is development and accomplishment. This is one that I've addressed already. This is the principal idea that you are focusing on progress. So this is those shots of, 
Yes, that one I did know, which is cool. Um, so the idea here is when you're using development and accomplishment, it's what I mentioned earlier. It's when the game recognizes your progress and the game says, whoa, you're doing really, really good. You're awesome. Here's some stuff, boop, more serotonin in the brain. You're happy, you're excited, you're motivated. So to do this, I have a leveling system. I have item systems. I have points of access um, and a variety of different tools and techniques to give kids different you know, light at the end of the tunnel. So if I do this, I go here. If I do this, I can go here. If I do this thing, then I can go and have access to this area or this component, whatever it may be in your game. So you give kids progressive markers the same way games do. You know, you can't go to, you know, this castle until you're level 10 and you can't really get to level 10 until you clear out this village that's full of bad guys or whatever. So it's that map that the kids are following that they don't know they're following that then has the divergence of different side tasks and quests and, and unlockable features. Um, the third one is creativity and feedback. And creativity and feedback, we look at nothing more than Minecraft. It is just the ultimate in what's called a sandbox game. It is the idea of creating a game that doesn't really give you restrictions. You can just go in and you can play and you can do whatever you want. So this is why the creative mode in Minecraft is so popular because you can create anything you want in any capacity in any fashion you want. Then you can invite people in and you can say, hey, check this out, I built the Eiffel Tower. And then people are like, whoa, you did a really good job. And then you get really excited. So then you look, oh, I wanna build a Statue of Liberty. I wanna do this. That's what creativity is. So I have, what I, when I do quests or work, what I, what I do is I don't pay, my, the terminology I use, I don't pave the road. I say, this is the person you met and this is the problem that they have. How are you going to solve it? I don't say, this is how you solve it, which I find that's an issue that I have with traditional education is we will often teach something and then the examples, the black line masters, the, the exemplars, the demos, whatever that we show in class, the kids literally just take that exact example and then build their project with it. So I try to eliminate that by saying, okay, you know, you got to help this person do this and I'll give specific examples shortly. And it has to be done by this time because we're moving to the next city. It doesn't matter how you do it, but how would you solve that problem in real life? So it's the idea of, you know, you, you come across a bridge that's broken, but you have to cross it in real life. There's no internet, no books. You can only talk to the people you're with. How do you solve this problem? You know, you've never taken bridge building 101. So how do you solve that problem? Be as creative as you want. And that's kind of the idea behind it. So these are very, very powerful motivators. The next three, ownership and possession. This is why Dragon Box works because you want to take care of something that you own and you want to protect it and you want to get more of it. The concept of Dragon Box is um, you have this little box, the dragon pops up, he wants to eat because he's hungry, but he's scared because there's things on the screen. So you have to make the things go away. All of these things are related to algebra. And what they do is, you know, if you have a black tile and a white tile and you put them together, they disappear because it's negative and positive canceling each other out. Um, you know, if you have, that's pretty much my extent of algebra. So it's all the different kinds of things. So it's pretty cool. But that's the thing, right, Jennifer, that's it. There's so much emphasis on how things are designed in stores, casinos, all kinds of stuff that get you addicted to that feeling. It's actually translatable in, in classes and in schools, you know, maybe not, maybe not addicted to English class, but, you know, as close as we can get to it for sure. So my idea for ownership and possession was game cards, um, which someone mentioned earlier in the chat, which again, I'll, I'll, got a bunch of stuff to show you. Once you get to the ownership and possession and kids start earning these game cards, they give you distinct advantages and perks and abilities to attack and defend and all kinds of things. But what I find is kids rarely want to use them because they love the ability of having them and holding on to them. So that's pretty fun to watch how kids view it in that different capacity. And then in Dragon Box, as I mentioned, you want to uh, get the dragon to eat. You want to take care of it and protect it and do those different kinds of things. So when you look at that, Dragon Box works because you don't want anything wrong to happen to your dragon. You know, um, The next one, I love this one, the social influence and relatedness. This is the idea that you are related to, uh, um, you are motivated by how people view you, act around you, how you act around them, all of those different kinds of things. It's your decisions are based off of what people think you would say. So the example that I love to use um, is, you know, aside from social media influencers, whatever the heck that is, um, 
you turn around and you say, we like to believe we're not motivated by other people and ideas, but the hard reality is we are. So uh, a power company had an amazing example of this. So they were called O Power and they were in Ohio. And what they did was they're having rolling brownouts. They're having a huge problem with too much electricity being used. And um, as they went around, they, they were doing advertisements on the radio, billboards, whatever. They couldn't get people to stop um, using power or less power um, in order to help them with the system and the demand on the system. So one person, and I was just picture in a boardroom, I just picture some guy being like, well, I would just show everybody what to do. And, and so without lit, with little education, the next bill cycle that they sent out, they put a graph of the street that the person lived on and it showed every address's power consumption. So now you got, you know, two people walking the dog down the street and they look at each other and they're like, Hey, I know you, you live at 112. I live at 142. You know, I know how much power you use, you power pig. And you know, all these people were, were having this competition. And all of a sudden, because people knew that you weren't following or you were abusing power or whatever, they started to use less and it became next month. Who was the most, who was the best. And in one year of doing this, by just simply saying, hey, this is how much power you use in comparison to your neighbors, they dropped um, a terawatt of power use. So they saved a terawatt of power and $250 million in savings for the company just by people walking around saying, you know, I don't want to be the person who's using the most power. I don't want to be perceived as greedy or not, not paying attention or whatever the case may be. So it was massively successful so this is where you get your leaderboard dynamic in a classroom um, this is where you get ranking systems this is where you get leveling systems and it, it's pretty cool um, the next one is scarcity and impatience this one is very simple you are mostly in your houses i would assume at this moment you could probably turn your head and look and find something that you bought on impulse because it was on sale they were in limited quantity or as most kids do someone else was looking at it and you were scared that they were going to take it so you bought it and that being the case, this is, I, I will do sales and auctions. I will do limited quantities of items. Um, you know, for example, if you have children, you have all seen the example of a toy that nobody has touched for 17 years in the corner and in four inches of dust. And then one kid comes up and picks it up. And then it somehow triggers a signal in the other kid's brain to come running home from school to scream and yell that they were just about to play with that toy and you can't touch it. And it's just the idea of, of you need what you need when you need it and you will act on impulse in order to do it, um, which is pretty fun. And then the last two are unpredictability and curiosity and then loss and avoidance. So unpredictability and curiosity is where I look at another um, thing in the gaming industry is they've, they've shifted to card packs. So you can now build these teams um, based on cards that you receive um, in the game. And this is why card packages and unboxings and things like that are so exciting because you look at the different, you know, it could be, it's the Schrodinger's cat idea. It's the, anything can be in this package of this box until I open it and then find out what it is. So it's that excitement of being able to open it up and like, Whoa, this is, you know, did I get this card, this type of thing, um, which is really exciting. Uh, I will get to that. Yes, actually, when it comes to stat sheets, I'll tell you. So I, you know, my idea is, is I made card packs out of tinfoil, which is cool. I see a lot of teachers doing that now. Tinfoil is an amazing resource in gamification, I'm telling you. And um, you just put your things in, fold it all up, seal it. And then once it's all sealed and together, you have a card package, uh, you know, at fractions of a penny. Um, and then you can create your own custom stickers on the pack. And then all of a sudden you have a card package and then kids love it and they are used as rewards and they, you, they're used as, um, incentives and different kinds of things that kids can buy and kids love it. Um, the, the idea that I, the example that I'd like to use about this is the one that you Kai Chu uses himself, which is the speed cam lottery. There was an area in Sweden. And again, I say this every presentation, if you've heard me speak one day, I'll remember to look up and confirm, but in this country, they were having an issue with speeding in a particular area. And despite the fact of increasing police presence, increasing fines, whatever, people kept speeding through these areas. So one guy just said, again, I just picture at a board meeting where he's just like the one dude who's frustrated with everything. And he's just like, 
just take a picture of everybody. And so that's what they did. So when you drove through this area, your license plate had a picture taken care of. And when you take a picture of it, you went into the good pool, pool A, if you were following the proper protocol and speed. But if you were speeding, you went into pool B and had a fine. At the end of every month, they did what they called speed cam lottery. They took every single license plate and threw it in a randomizer or whatever they did, bingo ball thing, spinning it around, who knows? And they drew a name. And let's say that month they collected $20,000 in fines. Well, the city or the police department or however those fines work, they got half of it, but a good driver was rewarded for their good behavior and won 50% of the fines collected in that area for that month. So it motivated so many drivers. And I want you to think about that in education. How much time and effort are we spending being hard on uh, and difficult with and challenging and dealing with kids that we, we perceive as being difficult or having problems and forgetting about the kids that are crushing it and doing the amazing things. And that's one of the things that, that again, you know, a big take home for gamification is you want to make sure that you're hitting everybody in your design. You don't want it to be tasks that only high achieving kids would do and kids who are bored or, you know, or kids who, who don't believe that they're good in your subject, you know, are going to just, Oh, can't do this too hard. So when you use that unpredictability and curiosity, you have the ability to bring everybody together by using a bunch of different, you know, facets and ideas. Um, and then loss and avoidance is a simple, you know, we don't want things that we care of to die. We don't want people to die. We don't want pets to die. We don't want to lose items that we've collected for years. So, you know, in my game, you can die. There's punish there's punishments for dying. Um, if you don't take it seriously, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and it, it's the simplest one for kids to understand because it plays on your basic human emotion of, of not wanting death, <laughs> I would assume. Um, now, the other researcher I lean a lot on is if we understand how people are motivated, you have to understand why kids play games. And this is my little disclaimer here. A lot of people who talk about this talk about a guy named Richard Bartle. And Richard Bartle did this and was totally good. Um, okay, so it's super funny that you mentioned this, Tessa. My wife is a psychologist. And we had this debate yesterday about dopamine or serotonin. And she says dopamine or serotonin depends on um, the thing. So I used to say dopamine in my presentation. And she's like, you should say serotonin. And I was like, hmm. So I'm going to say serotonin. And I was waiting for someone to say it. So I'm glad that you did. Because, um, I, yeah, it, it, to me, it's, it's dopamine. It, and then serotonin has a deeper level of connection. Um, what they found is that dopamine is the, you have your phone and you're anticipating messages and you have the excitement about receiving it, which releases dopamine. And then serotonin is a deeper connection one, um, as she explained it to me. Um, and again, I trust her because, you know, this is what she does. But again, I know it's a combination between two. It's so funny to me that you brought that up because I was like, I feel like people are going to be familiar with dopamine. Yeah, so that, that's what she had mentioned. So I may not be explaining it correctly 100%, but there's like, there's four neurochemicals that all have different ways of connecting um, play in the brain and excitement and, you know, arousal and joy and all those different kinds of things. So, so um, yeah, but that's cool. It, it's definitely something you, you will see a lot of, you know, all of the brain chemicals going in gamification. Um, so cool. Thank you for that. That's fun. That's funny to me. Um, so when you're looking at this, um, as I was mentioning before, for Richard Bartle, um, he created years ago in the early 80s. No problem. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, this what's called an MMO. So a massive, mul a mass multiplayer online game, if I'm not mistaken. And when they went online, he wanted to find out why these people were playing this game. So he came up with these four player types and he had like killer, explorer, adventure, something, you know, anyway, I don't use them. Here's why I don't use them. Richard Bartle himself said to stop using them. When you look up player types, this is the model that you should be using. And I'll take that to my grave, speaking of loss and avoidance. Um, and it is simply because 
these are modern and adapted. When Richard Bartle did his research, he was not trying to look for a why people do things across all subjects. He was trying to figure out why people did things in the game that he created for research and the, the, that concept. He was not interested in, in trying to figure out why um, people did things outside of that game space. So years and years ago, even in consultation together, they turn around and they say, um, a guy named Andre Mer, now here's his name at the bottom. I'll use my fancy light. I just want to give him proper credit. Mars Marzuski. And again, uh, one day I'll say his name properly, you know, whenever that day is. And he created what he called the hexod of player types. And he took Bartle's research and did gamification research of his own in consultation with all kinds of other researchers. And he realized, and he has a wicked book, by the way, called Even Ninja Monkeys Like to Play, Gamification, Game Thinking, and Motivational Design. It's a wicked book. It's small. It's quick. It's an easy read. He's a hilarious dude. Um, I'm a big fan of him. Um, and this, this thing that he made here was kind of a collaborative effort between him and I, so to speak, like 98% him, 2% me. <laughs> but I found his player type models when I was designing my game. And I said, have you ever thought about this in education? And he sent me an article he wrote, uh, like a blog on his website. His website is called gamified.uk. And when he went uh, in this article, he was saying, you know, here is where I believe people fit in school. I'm just looking at your con. Yes. So you could use terms like this. Absolutely. I love the player names myself just because I'm a big geek, but you could interchange them a hundred percent. And, and that's a great point, Joanna. So um, the idea here is these are the different ways that he took it, his hexod of player, philanthropist, free spirit, achiever, socializer, and disruptor. Those were the six things, hexod, hexagon, that he believed and his research pointed to where those people play games. And then I said, have you ever applied it to education? And he gave me this model, but he said, I don't know where to put a disruptor because I want to be very specific about where I put the circles. And I said, well, let me tell you, let me add my little contribution piece to your research. The disruptor has to be in the middle because the disruptor has the ability to go outward and affect everything, but be affected by everybody in the game. So they are both an effector and affected, if I said that correctly. So when you're looking at this, this is a really, really powerful tool in gamification design. So number one, as I want to say, we have to stop focusing on the achiever. These are your self-driven kids. And that's a good point, Joanne. I appreciate that. Um, depending on your age, your kids, your communities, your expectations, those would definitely be much safer words than, you know, um, using killer or barbarian with a kindergarten class or whatever. Um, so totally valid point. And, um, <laughs> good. I'm, I'm glad you're checking me, Jennifer, make sure I'm not looking fool more foolish than I normally do. Um, so what we have here is we have to stop focusing on the achiever. And what that means is that the, the achiever is the kid who walks into your classroom and it doesn't matter what you tell them to do. They're going to do it and they're going to succeed and they're going to be great at it. So we have to stop designing things for them because it doesn't matter what we design. They're going to do it. It's these five that we have to try to build. Yeah. He's a, he's a really cool dude. It's, it's these guys that we have to build into hopefully becoming those self-driven people. So um, yeah, so what I mean by that is that your, your achiever, your achiever player type is the type of kid that'll come into your class and you have your, you know, your assignment written on the board. They just go and they do it right away. You don't have to help them. They don't need to be motivated to any capacity. They they do whatever the assignment is in whatever capacity it is right away because they're self-driven people. So yes, a hundred percent true Tessa. And the idea there is that Bartle um, actually has a player test on his website where you can run. So I know, or sorry, 
uh, Merzef Andre has the um, player test type where you can have your kids at the beginning of the year take the test and then based on the tests they have the ability to determine what player type they are and then if you want to tie them to game cards they could get the game card that represents that character um so with the self the the mode the achiever being self-motivated with everything what we want to make sure is that we're not focusing a huge amount on them because they're going to crush everything what we want to do is turn them into that leadership aspect in the classroom so here are the other five. Number one, you have your socializer. These are the people who love to work in groups collaboratively. Um, they like competition. And when you design things that have these types of elements, you will get this type of kid. So I have guild battles and different levels of competition in my classroom. The player, this is the person who loves to learn for reward. This is also the type of kid who's like, yeah, I'll do that if, I'll do that if. So you might have kids who are like, you know, I totally will go erase all the whiteboards if you give me some of that gum on your desk, that'd be a cool trade, right? You know, give me some of that. I'll do some of this, you know, I'll do this assignment. If you give me a game card, I'll do this. If you give me bonus XP. So as these things continue to progress forward, that's what a player type is. The, the philanthropist is often the kid who wants to learn by teaching others. And it's also, it's, it's also the kid you often don't want to be teaching others. So, you know, you teach this, you know, math teachers are notorious for this, right? You teach the lesson and then they go to the, the assignment and you got lots of hands about questions and you're, you know, you're frantically going around trying to help. And you got the one kid who's like, I got this, you know, I'll go help everybody out. It's all good. And you're like, no, sit down. You're going to undo everything that I've just done. But they love to go and help and support. You know, they love to run fundraisers. They love to be involved in the school community. They love to be involved in their own communities. They like to be, you know, run an assembly. So whatever the case may be, they like to learn by teaching. Um, then you have the free spirit. This is the person who, and I, and I love to use this example because this, this is the definition of spirit 101. The free spirit is the kid who, whose learning doesn't look like normal learning, which would be me. Okay. I had a kid two last year who spent the bulk of my class. I have no furniture in my room, which I'll get to in a second, rolling around on the ground. That's just kind of what he did. And people would just kind of look at him and I was like, just leave him alone. It's all good. He's just kind of, you know, rolling around and he's kind of like this, acting like he wasn't paying attention, but he would destroy assessments. His way of learning was he needed to move. So when he was stuck in a desk in a traditional classroom, he got so frustrated and agitated that he wouldn't pay, he would, he would tune out in order to keep himself kind of motivated and, and excited. So now when he could get his, you know, I was kind of get the wiggles out if you're, if you're a younger school teacher. And as he would kind of move around and roll and do his own thing, he was absorbing information in his own capacity. So letting kids have different um, capacities and different beliefs and different ways of, of soaking up information is, is really important. And then of course you put the disruptor in the middle because this is the, you know, the kid who's causing the distractions, they need specific supports. But when you put kids in teams and you have an achiever paired with a disruptor, the achiever, excuse me, the achiever really works hard with the disruptor to not affect them and not affect the group because the achiever wants to do well. So you have to teach them how to be leaders and that natural leadership quality begins to come out. So essentially, oops, 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 oops. The biggest thing here is we have our eight ways that we're motivated, epic meaning and calling, development, accomplishment, creativity, feedback, ownership, possession, social influence related to scarcity of patience, unpredictability, curiosity, and loss and avoidance. Once you build these into your game, you then build the player types, player, philanthropist, free spirit, achiever, socializer, and disruptor. And some of you may be looking at that and going, whoa, this is a lot of information. Well, Andre is gotcha. So... It, yes, I love that. We have to change our perspective of what learning looks like. Thank you, Sylvia. Learning does not have to be sitting in a desk with a textbook, super quiet and, and you know, with a pencil and a paper or whatever the case may be. Learning looks like a million different things and that's okay. And I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, if there's one thing you want to take a picture of or a screenshot, it would be this. Um, this again is created by that Andre who created this, he says, if you want to design, here are simple questions. So if you have a philanthropist, how can I help someone would be a question that you should try to infuse into a different assignment. Now, you don't have to do all of these in every assignment. Like you got to be mindful. But one assignment might have more of a philanthropist lean. 
and one might have more of a player lean. Okay. You know, how can I improve the experience of others? Achievers, what is going to challenge me? How can I learn something new? Socializers, how can I connect with people? So I have used these questions repeatedly in designing my own assessments and my own quests, which I call, which are my work and all those different kinds of things in order to create things that are going to grasp everybody's attention in different ways. People struggle with the disruptive, like, well, how do I break something? Who can I upset? Well, what the heck would I want that in school? Here's my favorite example ever. Okay. And I'm going to scroll massively ahead to something and we'll come back to all of this in a second. And it's, it's going to move a little quicker now that I've got kind of the, the big bulk part done. I want to show you this. Okay. This is the game called tumbling tower that I use. And this is where a disruptor totally broke my game in such a cool, creative way. And I'm going to show you a video of this in a bit. But what you're looking at here is, is this person has to pick a brick out of the Jenga tower and put it on top. But I have all kinds of rules written on the blocks. So this one is uh, this girl here had to pick with her hand backwards. So her back was to the tower, as you can see. And she had a player on her team being her eyes. So saying, move your arm up, left, right, down, whatever the case may be, which created a I take a simple game and added a really ridiculous twist to it that made it harder, which levels the playing field. And if you pull the brick, so you, you, I guess I should go back a step. You answer a trivia question. If your group is correct, you send a player up, they remove a brick. If they can take the brick out and put it on the tower, you get the points that were associated to that trivia question. And as a side note, my YouTube channel has a, a list of something called guild battle and the guild battle is going to have all of these games. So a kid goes, well, what happens if you knock the tower over? I said, oh, your score goes to zero. So I want you to remember the language that I use because I said that nonchalantly without thinking. So here's what happens. We have a kid and I'll go back now to my previous stuff. So many slides. Um, okay, so we go back to this and it says, how can I upset something? Who can I upset? How can I break? So it's not always a negative connotation. So this kid's group in particular, they go up, they get a couple questions wrong. And just like Jeopardy, you go into the negative. So they're at like negative 1500 and a couple groups are, you know, running away at the game. And all of a sudden the tower comes up to their group and this kid's eyes just like, like jump out of his head. And he goes, wait a second. And they get the question right so that they can pull the block. But he whispers something to his teammate who's going up and the teammate goes up and he just punches the tower over. And everyone's like, oh, that's so stupid. Why'd you do that? And the kid looks at me and he goes, we were uh, minus 1500. And I said, yeah. And he goes, put my score to zero. And I was like, oh my God, you totally, totally broke the rules of the game. You found a loophole in the game. You knew there was no way that you're going to catch up. But if you knock the tower over, I said, reset your score to zero. I didn't, you know, that was the language I used. So he reset the score to zero. So I reset the score to zero. All the other groups got all frazzled and they started messing up and getting questions wrong. And this team ends up winning the game in the end because of a simple adjustment to the rules and how I stated them. And this is what I like about gamification. You're going to see a different level of thinking from kids. That is the absolute most concrete thing that I want kids to walk away from is that creative thinking, that challenging the system, that challenging the norm, that viewing things in a different lens, any language you want to use. He turned and he was like, got it. We're never going to win. However, now I've just gained 1500 points and I'm back at zero. And it was such an incredibly cool way because that kid was definitely classified as a disruptor and break meant he wanted to break the rules of my game and in turn became a folk hero to kids because everybody talked about that. And now every single, and even this happened exactly. Uh, this happened four years ago. And the incredible part about it is that kids know this story somehow, some way, and they all know that if they're struggling to just push the tower over and uh, this kid is a legend, which, so it's, it's just cool to me to see, you know, the reach of stuff. So, Here's what gamification is, okay? This is just a quote, I'm not famous, so I just self-quote myself. It doesn't have to be boring, okay? That's my big thing with education. So number one, you can do a lesson, a unit, or a year-long thing, okay? 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I love those comments. Totally agree. So when you look at this, the number one is a lesson. This is where I would start. Okay. So, um, absolutely they do. Um, so what happens really quickly is if you want to do a lesson, the emphasis you want is fun game, small prize and a teamwork. So here's something that you can do right away. Well, I guess when you're more in person, use that tumbling tower game. So one day, um, I walked into my classroom and I put a big number four on the board on Monday and then I left. And then I, you know, hung out the staff room. I showed up intentionally in my class about a minute late and I walked in, you know, had my coffee. I'm like, Hey guys, how's it going? Good morning. You know, let's get our, why is there a big number four on the board? What are you, what are you guys doing? And they're like, Oh, you did it. I'm like, guys, I just walked into the classroom. Like you had another teacher open the door for you. I, I you know, I run, I ran late this morning. So then, you know, put the little bug in their ear, you know, some believe me, some didn't. Then the next day there was a three. Next day there was a two. So the kids quickly realized there was a countdown going on. There was not a single kid who missed that Friday because they knew that on Friday, something had to be happening. I kept playing it up. Like I didn't know who wrote it. I kept playing up. Um, <laughs> I was a bit more enthusiastic. Yeah, you can say that for sure. Um, and yeah, I, I went all in for sure. This is a, this is an example of something you could do for sure. But yeah, I went year long. Um, and my next slide says I wouldn't recommend it, but that's just me. Um, and I'll explain why. Uh, so I went with the lesson aspect. So again, kids come Friday and I walk in and I'm playing it up like I have no idea. And so I go in Thursday night and I, I just set up the Jenga tower. I put a black garbage bag over it and I put an envelope with a question mark on it. And I'm in my class and the kids come in on Friday and they're all just surrounded and they're like just massively fascinated by this thing. And they're like, what is this? Why is this here? And the kids are trying to peek. I'm like, don't touch it. I don't even know what it is. You know, so we go to this lesson. I say, guys, it was me all along. And they're like, I do it. And it's just like this ridiculous uproar. And then we play a game. We play the, the, tumble, the tumbling tower game. So the team wins. They focus on teamwork. They're doing all the things. And then I say, here's your prize. It's the envelope. And they open the envelope and the answer. And it, it's, it's like, it's all in this like whimsical font because my classroom is medieval themed. And it's all this kind of like medieval goofy language. But in essence, it says, I'm going to answer a one point question on your quiz tomorrow or on Monday in this case. And the kids went, what? So think about this. I had, it was like a 47 mark quiz. I'm willing to answer a one point question. So a true, false, multiple choice or matching for any kid on that team who won that. That was the single biggest motivating factor I've ever seen for kids. Because on Monday, you would see kids, they're like, oh man, what the? Put their hand up, yep. And, the, and they're like, need you. And they're like very, I just need you to answer question 23. I don't know what, you know, and they're like super proud that I'm answering this one point. You know, kids are going to get thousands of points throughout the year that I assess. One is nothing. One is a drop in the ocean. But to that kid in that moment, they put so much effort to get that, that it was like the, you know, the biggest rock star moment ever for them. So a simple prize is sometimes just giving a kid something that they wouldn't have access to or anything like that. Then you can go for a unit. Here's what I did with the kindergarten teacher when I helped them design an activity. I said, what is, what is, cause you can do this with any age. One of the people here, if she's still here is Allison, who ironically enough was one of my university professors. Um, and she's applying gamification to university. And I saw earlier, we have people who are kindergarten teachers. It can work in any capacity. You just have to design it to meet your audience. So for the unit, for the kindergarten teacher, she was like, I just don't know if the kids will get it. I'm like, oh, they'll get it. Kindergarten kids will lose their mind for this. So I said, here's a, um, here is a, uh, or sorry, I should say this. What is one thing in your class that kids associate to you? And then they're like, it's my coffee mug, you know, you know, got my name on it. And I've got my, my coffee and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, on Monday, that coffee cup is going missing. And I said, you gotta, you gotta sell it. So you, you can't be like, oh, where's my mug? Like, yeah, guys, have you seen it? Like, did you take it? Like, it was right here. And so she played it up and played it up and, and kept kind of, you know, going and going with it. And as they continued to do this, the kids became massively captivating with finding it. So later on in the day, when they were out at recess on their little reading carpet, she dropped an envelope and the kids found it and they would tear it open. They're super excited. And then they, they read it. And what she did was she started pulling sight words from her board. So this kid started to learn vocabulary because they were massively interested in what this note said. And the note was like, you know, I have your coffee mug. You'll never find me. Um, you know, you'll never find out who did it. 
Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, kids love everything. Like it doesn't matter what the prize is. Kids just love to have prizes. So yeah, smelly lotion would be awesome. Hand sanitizer now would be a great prize. <laughs> um, so she continues to leave these clues using the curriculum. So certain math things led to numbers and then the numbers led to rooms. And then in the rooms, there were clues and the clues had to be deciphered with word walls. And then they, you know, all these different kinds of curriculum things that they were hitting. And it led to the principal who agreed to this in advance and the principal, she was like, okay, the kids figured out that we got to go to your office. They think it's you. They're all going to be like super quiet. They're dressing as detectives, you know, around 9am after now, since we're going to come kick in your door, you know, so that the kids show up, they kick in, you know, okay, I you. And the, the principal had a spinny chair. He like spins around in the chair. He's like, how did you find me? And he's like drinking from the coffee mug. The kids are rioting, going crazy. But she said it was the most, insane two weeks she's ever done because she couldn't give kids enough information and enough work so when you captivate them in a story that is what gamification is when you build them into something that epic meaning and calling right that curiosity and unpredictability that uh, you know you are putting them in a scenario where they become something these little detectives that are solving a crime and helping so it was really really cool um and then you can do year long which is what i did which is you have a big story a big theme you have elements of mystery and you start infusing all of these things into a year long process. Now I would recommend you don't start year long. However, I did go year long because that's me. If you're watching this presentation and you're like, my goodness, this is a lot of stuff like ugh. really simple, start small and work your way up. If you're, you know, I saw, you know, Bobby in there, Jordan. Um, I know Jason was here earlier, you know, they went full bore, and, you know, we all had our struggles as we did it. And yeah, good. Let me know how it goes. It would be so awesome. And um, what they did was they, they jumped in full bore and, you know, we had our challenges and our struggles as we did it. And we used each other and, and we helped each other work through it. Um, but it is a bit more challenging. Um, but again, you can do whatever you are comfortable with. Then the next is I want to talk about the difference between story and narrative. Story is the concept of your game. So for me, the evil Minotaur King has found this. Um, yeah, and, and Alistair, that's a cool thing about this, this drama teacher and stuff. That's an element of gamification. That's one of the core drivers that you're hitting, right? You're using the creativity and feedback to communicate ideas. You're using the epic meaning and calling to solve a mystery. You're using the curiosity and unpredictability of where they are. So this is what I mean. So you, you can probably start to have the gears turning in your head about things you're already doing. And just a tiny tweak here or there is going to fit one of those player types or fit one of those um, octalysis human motivators. So it's, it's a really cool and powerful tool um, that we can use and share for sure. So my idea is that, um, we're a resource heavy community and nation and we're doing some mining. We find the stone where it gets out that we find the stone and the bad guy, the Minotaur King comes in, captures me because I'm the leader of the land and imprisons and destroys my people and stuff and enslaves them and all these bad things. And then he turns around and, and I, you know, I need someone to save me. There's your epic meaning and call it. Then we go to narrative. These are the people that they meet. So if you picture playing a, a, a game, you meet people along the way that give you tasks, story elements, you know, whatever the case. So as they go, they meet people. So story is the main concept narrative is the ongoing story that your players progress through as they play. Theme is very important to this, okay? I am a big proponent of theme. If you say, we're in a medieval fantasy land and it's unbelievable, we've got dragons, we've got this, we've got that, and all of a sudden they walk into your class and it's nothing is different about it, nothing. And you're like, dragons and quests, Kids are not going to be as enthusiastic about it. And if you aren't enthusiastic about it, they're not going to care. Trust me on that. You can, it, it's that, you know, selling, um, you know, that, that greasy car salesman mentality. Yes, I go more of an episode kind of thing. I, I have my general plot of like, these are the bad guys they're going to meet at the end of every unit. These are kind of some of the quests I want to do. And then I kind of go in that manner. And then I make adjustments along the way. If kids are really into one concept or idea, I might maybe put a little more emphasis on that, you know, things like that. But that's a great question. 
So um, you want to sell the idea to them, come in and be excited and be losing your mind and be like, can you believe this guys have ever seen this? Ah, and the more you inject your enthusiasm into them, kids are going to be massively excited about it. And that's, that's one of the things like I've got 13 year old kids that I teach and people were like, Oh, dragons, are they going to be into that and medieval fantasy? And I'm like, yeah, because they get swords and they can kill things and they can fight and, you know, they can solve mysteries and unlock things and blah, blah, blah. And, and there's just, it goes on and on. There's so many elements. So you want to be enthusiastic. So I recommend if you're going to build a website, theme it to your theme. This, I am in no way associated with these companies, but I like Weebly. That's my choice for building a website. I find it to be simple and easy. It's a drag and drop system. Wix is... Um, a simple one as well, but try to have that, uh, that theme, right. That, that approaches things. I see my Google class this week. It's Marvel puzzle. Yeah. And, and again, those things are, are, that's what you want to do. Bringing in those elements of theme, keep kids really excited. So if it's not a themed unit, it might be a themed week, a themed day, a themed lesson, you know, those, they work all in different capacities for sure. So, um, I got a medieval style website. This is what my classroom looked like in my first rollout of gamification. It's kind of cool to see this. I haven't seen this picture in a while because I haven't been presenting. Um, but this is, uh, these kids are graduating this year, which is kind of neat. Um, so when you look at this, this is what my classroom looked like. I originally had furniture. I put them in little hubs, um, which I called my little uh, guilds or teams were guilds. Absolutely, absolutely. Give somebody a challenge, say it's never been done. There you go. You don't have to do anything else. So we've got these different groups here working. Um, I had my room. I tried to put some different things around it. And so this is literally rendition number one. The kids put, um, you know, some paper on my desk and some blue. They tried to make it look like a moat and a castle. It had this little battle board thing. And, you know, it, it looked all right. I had the armory. Oh, that's really cool to hear. Thank you, Jason. Um, I totally also went through an experience of not having everything ready. Um, and sometimes like be grinding the night before um, to have the elements built for the kids the next day. So it is one of those, one of those things where sometimes the kids move so fast through it that you, you have to continue to um, be okay with, you know, sometimes stretching things a little bit longer and, and, you know, telling kids, I'm very honest with kids that I teach and I'm like, you know what, I'm not quite there yet. So yeah, no, the, the summer, and that's why I wanted to do this now. Um, we find ourselves a little bit of extra time on our hands because it's a non-traditional environment we're in right now. So just different ways of thinking and tweaking assignments is, you know, sometimes the best way to start. So we go here and then again, that's what my classroom looked like. Then a couple of years later, I took out the furniture and I said, if I'm hiring, I want to go to theme. If I'm hiring, um, the the different students that come in as mercenaries to help me well you know what they're not going to show up with furniture they're going to use the land so i took all of the furniture out of the room yes i have two actually jennifer um and as you you go through this the kids um turned around um and they they looked at it and they said why is there no furniture and i said well you got to build it so there's your STEM learning, there's your cross-curricular connection. So the kids actually have to build their own furniture in my room if they want it. So they can do things, complete challenges, get assignments in, earn card packages, buy resources with game money. And when you do this, you can then earn resource cards like lumber or nails. And then I will physically give you actual building materials and you will build your own furniture which is hilarious because kids have no idea how to build furniture. It is riot to me. Um, what's going on here in this picture too, is kids are cracking codes here um, in order to unlock an assignment. So this was like a puzzle that people did um, where my students would do uh, to find numbers. The numbers would unlock a code, the code would lead them to an assignment. So you, again, just look at the captivity how captivated these kids are in simply solving little puzzles. So it's pretty fun. Also sitting is the new smoking. A lot of people say, so this allows kids to move around with no furniture. Um, I themed the middle of my room, like a big nerd. So there's like a campfire. 
Um, there's a Christmas tree here, you know, all kinds of stuff. And this is examples of some of the furniture that people built, um, which is kind of cool. This was called the unstable table, the eye table in the middle, um, which absolutely is one of the best stories ever about how they didn't have these support braces right there. You can see them really closely. And they actually um, lean on the table when they built it with no supports and it just went flying up and bonked a kid in the head, which I laughed my butt off about. It is, it, it killed me. I died laughing. And it taught them about the importance of engineering. We also had this um, bench fail. This was before it failed, which was a riot. Um, this was too long and there wasn't enough support in the middle. So they tried to fit five teenage boys on this thing. And one day during the lesson, they just crashed and broke through the table because they had no center support. This is what my classroom looks like now. And every single time I do this presentation, I give my head a shake and I go, I've got to take a better pictures of my classroom but we moved school buildings we built a new high school and oh that yes escape rooms are great absolutely great um and with the new high school the old high school moved to the new one of course and then that left a vacant high school building so the middle school ours was a bit small so we moved to the high school and so i had a new building and as as you look at this i had different things so here's a video of my classroom and I'm going to have to pause it because like a goofball, I went and moved way too fast uh, as I did this. So here is kind of the front of the room. Again, uh, I upgraded my desk here. Um, you can't see it, but if you look really, really carefully at like spots like this with how much I like theme right there, um, there's a little one kind of right over here. There's a couple behind my head here. Um, what you see is the notion and the idea that I have little glow in the dark stickers that create um, stars in my classroom. And the cool part is when it creates those stars, uh, they glow in the dark. So I can turn off all the lights in my room and it turns into nighttime, which again, I'm big on theme. I love that idea. Um, so let me go over here. So this is my battle board, which I'll talk about later. It's the interactive game that I've built that kids participate in. Um, this is leading to the prep room and I didn't want kids to go in the prep room. So I found some old trees that the drama department had made and I, I asked to use them. So I stuck them to the walls. I found this dead guy and I had a do not enter sign. In this year's model of the classroom, I have, um, you know, those magnetic nettings you can use to keep bugs out. I just installed one of those over the doorway. So it kind of makes it look a little bit cooler. So that's my prep room where kids can't go because that's, you know, my space chemicals and stuff. You don't want kids in there. That's where I hide all my tech stuff. So I try to hide technology so that it's more realistic um, for a medieval time. We continue forward. These are news articles that my class has been featured in. And then right beside it, because the class is about the kids, not me in a bigger space, I put, articles and things that acknowledge previous winners and incredible work. So this is a, so kids are creative with names. This is not Victoria's secret. This is Victoria's secret. And when we had our big end of game, end of year game, what they did was they um, made shirts. I had people who made flags, someone won an event and they made this like big colorful board. So I have an homage, like a hall of fame to previous kids and things like that. Um, we continue onward. I got some more. The, oh, shoot. Let me just get back to where we were there. Boop. And we pause. This is now a dungeon, which is kind of funny. So I've actually put up a wall here. And this is the dungeon where I can chuck kids if they're not really doing what needs to be done or they're causing a problem or they ought to write a test in you know, privacy or whatever. Um, it's pretty neat to see uh, kids love the concept of the dungeon, which is just a foam wall and I stick them behind it. Um, I got my wheel of chance. So I, this is a wheel that they spin. This is something that they can earn. This is unpredictability and curiosity. Each one of these numbers are bag. Each one of these envelopes or bags has a number that's tied to the wheel. You spin the wheel, you get the number, you roll number three, you get this and the contents of the envelope. And then these are all Velcroed on. So you pull the number off and put it in a bag in the back. So if you roll three again, again, tough luck, you don't get anything. 
this is my bulletin board, which is a giant mess right now, but uh, kids can communicate to each other through here so they can put notes of things for sale. This is the, the map of the classroom. These are just other bulletin boards. So I have like student of the week, guild of the week, treasure hunt clues. Um, this is the battle board all the way. So if, if you look, my the little board that I had here actually goes onto the countertop and extends around my entire class. So I have about a 60, what about 50 feet, I would say, of a custom game that wraps all around my room. You know, I got the basic science stuff of like your, you know, guts and things all over the place and jars and things. Um, I took an old fume hood that didn't work and I turned it into a dragon cave. And when you flick this, I found a, an LED light or an LED bulb that flickers like fire. So it looks like it's hot inside and there's fire. This is my dragon mate, um, dragon mine, which I'll talk about in a bit. These are my shops. I'm fortunate enough that I've got actual display cases inside my classroom. So I have my magic shop, I have my blacksmith, I have my general store, and I have my hall of fame. And the projects that are absolutely mind-blowingly cool um, go right here into the hall of fame, which and kids love to be in the hall of fame. This is my trader tent. I found this at Ikea for like 15 bucks. Um, I'll put items inside and I'll say, you know, in order to get what's in this chest, you have to give me the following, you know, two lumber, a nail, and a magic potion or whatever. And then the kids trade and then they get specific items. And that again, unpredictability, curiosity, kids don't know when that's going to come in and all those kinds of things. Um, and then we get to the back to the front of the room. So that's kind of what my room looks like right now. I'm just going to check the chat real quick here. How do you know, how do you do your student of the week? Um, actually, you know what, Tessa, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, we look forward to that. Um, thanks for coming, Eric. Um, we'll probably be on here for a bit longer for sure. I know I wanted to stop at 11, but I'm about three quarters of the way done. So you can check back over here. Thank you for coming though. Appreciate it being a big supporter. Um, what I do is I try to eliminate grades. I look at things for most improved, significant changes, go, group cohesiveness and things like that. And when you, when you take the emphasis off grades, you then have the kids who are like, you know, oh, I'm not good at this, blah, blah, blah. And instead it could be the kid who, you know, the kid who does, you know, they might have a kid who does nothing. And all of a sudden they do, you catch them doing something amazing. They might be my student of the week to, to positively emphasize those things that they were doing in order to build that kid up so that they feel good and positive about themselves and get something that they may have never achieved in another room. So don't always, I guess the advice I would be is, is don't always focus on a grade, but you might be like, wow, this group is amazing this week. They went from fighting all the time as a group to, you know, participating really good together. Or, you know, you went from a 50 on a test to a 90. You can have those individual conversations with kids. So you don't want to be like, hey, you go to 15 to 90 if you know that they wouldn't like that public. Um, and then if you look on my YouTube channel, what they get is a custom WWE belt and I show you how to make them. So the kids walk around with this like big custom made belt that shows their, you know, the, the player, or the team of the week. So kids really like that. So that's a great question. Um, so, okay, we're going to start motoring on here. So we got game language. When you're using game language, that really transforms how things are going. Okay. Using instead of test, using quiz or using battle and things like that make significant changes in the way kids view your school. So, look at it like a game. Is Mario going to go over this gap? Well, of course he is. You know, he's already halfway over. Unless he suddenly drops, he's going to make it right there. No problem. Well, is he going to make this gap? I don't know. But if you were to look at it, uh, guilds do switch um, once a month for the first two months. And then every, uh, then I go about every two to three months. And then kind of about by month seven, I try to have the group stay together for the rest of the year. But one way is, as I try to tell them, the grass is not always greener on the other side. You don't want to switch groups and be with all your best friends because chances are you're going to goof off and that's just natural, right? So sometimes I try to challenge, I, and most groups that win at the end of the year by having the most XP and most success are the kids that stay together um, the longest because they learn, they learn to each other's strengths and weaknesses and they grow really cohesively together as a group, which is cool. Now, if I were to ask you to do this jump, everyone would try it. If I ask you to do this jump, everyone would still try because it it's a game. And you know what happened? Mario falls down, 
bloop, and then peers back here and you get to try again. School doesn't do that though. School views us, you know, you jump and you fall into the death trap of tests and things and you fail and, oh, I'm never going to get to the A plus. I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to get to that hundred percent or to the grades that I need. But when you go, I want you to remember something. There's been no study that has ever been produced that my knowledge of my knowledge that says punitive marks and punishments motivate kids. They actually pull them back to withdraw. And if you know, um, Rick Romelli, who's a famous, um, you know, researcher and speaker in education, he turns and he says, we often do this, we often stand above the pit, which is why I like this. We stand above the pit like this, and we look down on the kids. And we say, you know, that, you know, what's it like down there in that pit, you know, that'll teach you to study, you got a 50. You know, the only way to get out of that pit is to do this. But in kid, kids don't view that as you putting down a rope and um, choosing you know, to help them up. They view that as, well, I'm no good. And I, I, I deserve to be in this pit. And you know what, screw it. I'm just going to stay down here because that's what this teacher thinks I am. So you want to be really clear about being, you know, retests, redos, different options, you know, whatever you can do to build a kid's capacity to want to try again, if they don't succeed by creating that safe environment. Um, because again, I quote myself, grades should be a motivational tool. They shouldn't be something to deter you should make a kid feel just as proud of getting a 70 as someone does of getting a 95. Okay. They might have completely different circumstances. You never know about people's home life, about people's struggles, people's finances, nothing. You don't. So it's really important to understand that grades should be a positive tool for kids. And I'm telling you, you poor, poor math teachers, you have my heart. That's hard to do in math. It's hard to get kids to care. And uh, so it's, it's important. Think about that when you're doing grading. Um, so do you choose the guild groups or did the kids choose? I start off and I'll show you later. If you go to classtools.net, there's a randomizer wheel. Um, and I put all the kids name in and it randomly sets the teams for me. We do like a draft, um, which is what I'm about to talk about right here. And um, then they can choose to switch later, but it's specific parameters. I might say, you have to have, you know, based on the numbers of my class, you have to have six per group minimum and two groups can have seven because, you know, I can't have a group of two, um, you know, or every group has to have, you know, two boys or two girls or whatever, right? You can set any parameters so that they can't just be like, okay, I want to go here, boom, I'm out, you know, and have a group of 10 and a group of three and, a, you know, the kid that no one wants to be with or, you know, whatever, those kinds of situations that can occur in school, you don't want that to happen. So you want to make sure that you kind of fuse it all together in a kind of a safe way. So I love the act of random because I often tell kids, I'm like, look, at you guys are about to start getting jobs. You can't choose who you work with. You can't choose your shifts. You know, you can't choose a lot of things in life. So it's about learning to get to these different elements. Um, and, and how do you tackle them now in a safe environment versus, you know, costing you a job in the future because um, you can't work with, with certain people. So I hope that kind of answers that. Um, why do I like groups? I like groups because it is so stinking important to have kids understand how to work face to face in the digital environment and world that we live in. The ability to have face to face human interaction is both dropping and people are kids are struggling with it. They're not particularly good at at working with each other. You know, they get frustrated easily. They just want to look up all the answers on the Internet. They don't trust each other. So I really love the idea of, of using groups. Um, when it comes to quests, re rename your stuff. Is it a spy thing? Well, maybe your work are missions. If it's medieval, it's quests. Um, you know, whatever, whatever the, the terminology you want to use. Um, and then I'll show you how I actually write my quests. Um, I, I'm big on cross-curricular, so you LA teachers will love this. Um, you can use things like augmented reality. If you're not familiar with, that's in my book. Um, and I don't want to use too much longer of people's time because we've already been at this for two hours and you guys are have the patience of angels to be listening to me this long. Um, but there's an app called Blipper, B-L-I-P-P-A-R, where you can actually create augmented reality. So kids can scan an item in your class and like a story will start talking or a website will come up and so you can hide elements. My tests are called boss battles, um, just a different language. My grades are called experience points. And again, I'll show you how they all work. So first of all, here's how quests work. I'm huge into the cross-curricular element of things. So what I do is I write them all in stories. The LA and social, or sorry, the LA reading and writing and comprehension was a bit low. So they, our district wanted to bring them up. So we started using a lot of like data and different reading assessment tools and things like that. 
And um, as we go through this, I wanted to not just be the science teacher. I wanted to fuse that cross curricular element. So I wrote all my things in two parts, an intro to tell you why you're there and how you got there. And then the actual story behind the work that you're going to do. And, and you don't have to be a good story writer. I, I was terrible in the beginning and I got better as I moved along, you know, and I like to include bigger vocabulary and push people, you know, as you move across the land, you soon discover the charred remains, many fallen warriors. Well, what's a kid do? What the heck does charred mean? You know, and then you teach them. Um, okay, so the thing with Blipper, and thank you for bringing that up, Tessa, is they're kind of a company in flux right now. Um, they used to be really, really good, and then I think they got into some financial trouble, and they didn't, I don't know if they still update or use the software. Um, the other one is uh, HP Reveal, which used to be called Erasma, and there's another one um, that I just saw. I'm going to try to find it and tweet it later. Um, but there's another company out of the Netherlands that just came out and they look like they've done some really cool stuff. Um, I just, the name slips me right now, but I will go ahead and look into it. Yeah. And that's the thing, Dalton. I totally love that. That's the, when you change the language, it creates a safer environment for kids. So this is kind of the intro. This is how you get there. Then I went to the quest. So this was the actual quest. So you, this guy, essentially, in, in a nutshell here, this guy comes out, he's been hit in the head, he needs your help. And so this is what you have to do. You have to figure out a way to preserve his knowledge or it's going to be lost forever. And he, had, he was doing research about cells. So the knowledge that you have to preserve is the material that I've taught you about cells, plant cells, uh, animal cells, structures, those kinds of things. And then you start to add different layers to it for the different types of kids. Can it be a song, a model, a story? It doesn't matter. I've had so many incredible examples of this. I could go, I could do an entire live stream about these things, but I've had kids do a song and dance because they've said, we don't have access to writing things. So we're going to do it. We're going to do a song and dance, almost like, you know, a TikTok dance or a viral video because people in that time used to communicate with song and dance because they didn't have material and it was easier to remember the rhyming pattern and movement pattern. So they taught me about cells through song and dance. I've had people use TV shows and build models of TV shows to say, this guy's like the new feels because he's the boss of the group. And this guy's like the mitochondria because he energizes everybody and gets them all fired up. Um, I mean, look at me right now. I'm so excited about this. This, this is what I love. It's so much fun. Um, you know, I've had just a multitude of all, I've even had a kid give me a pickle jar with cell items of different pickled vegetables inside of it. And he said, well, you said preserve. <laughs> and, but he had the, you know, the ingredients list was, you know, the orange thing is the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, 20 calories. So, I mean, whatever. And he, he made like, it's just, I could go on and on, but here's the trick. You can't Google, how do you preserve knowledge of a man who's been hit in the head that doesn't exist? So the kids couldn't just Google what to do. So then I said, you got, here's the only thing that has to be the parts we talked about in class. If you want to go further, you can add elements we haven't talked about. So in grade eight, we don't talk about rhizosomes, lysosomes, um, you know, all those different kinds of things. Uh, sometimes I do, yes, as needed. I have amazing EAs and I can't thank enough the EAs that I work with. They're incredible. Um, and they've done some narrative things for me. Um, sometimes if I have time, I'll, you know, record them in kind of like a cool, exciting kind of way. I'm a bit of a nerd. I like to edit and video and, and audio and stuff. So you can make kind of some exciting pieces as well in that regard, but that's a great question. Um, I'm, I, I do like accessibility and the ability for everyone to, to have access to it and not feel lost in the narrative. So if you can do some recordings, it, it's a great thing to do for sure. Um, and then I always say like creativity is key. So then I say, okay, you can earn 500 XP for this quest. It's gotta be completed as a team. Um, what I've started adding is Group work has to be done in class. Why? Very, very simple. I don't want you to go home and say that student A did all the work, student B did nothing, student C couldn't come over, student D is mad. I want it to be done in class. So if I have to do my assessment, I can see that you've contributed. I can talk to you in real time. Um, so I do a lot of group work, but I make it done in class so I can see the individual contributions. And then when I assess it, because this question always comes up, I either have individual chunks of things like you, there's these are the different roles you can take in this assignment or i'm watching you collaboratively for your contributions 
So I don't just say, oh, you got 100%, so you all get 40, uh, you know, 500 XP. Well, you get 500 XP because you were a leader, you did all the work, I say do the research. You get 100 XP because you worked one of the five days. And a, a, and a thing that a lot of teachers have a di- an issue with with what I do is I don't go in and handhold kids. I am not a believer in that. So if I, if I give a quest, I might be going, you know, run a battle board session or play a game with another group on the side. If you choose to do nothing, the deadline is still the deadline because we still have to progress to the next world. And then kids know, you know, September for a lot of kids is tricky with me because I'm not going to be like, okay, please do your work. Why aren't you doing your work? I'll walk by and be like, hmm, I see you're not doing anything. Probably wouldn't do that. And I just move. I don't debate. I don't beg. I don't plead. I don't handhold. And parents really appreciate this because in high school, if you're a high school teacher, you know, you don't have time to do that. You have bigger fish to fry. So kids, kids in grade eight, sometimes hit this compliance stage. So I'm just like, here's what you got to do. Here's you got to do it. You have questions by all means, but I ain't going to baby you through this process. And kids have found, come back and told me that they found that beneficial in high school because they're used to, to solving things and, and, you know, doing all their research and getting the things done before they come to me and before they expect someone to essentially do the work for them. Here's what my test looked like. Instead of uh, points, you earn damage points. So um, every time you get a question wrong, you lose hearts, or every time you get a question right, the monster loses hearts. And the goal is to kill the monster. And then I do things to motivate groups. I say, okay, if you kill all, if you know, I got 30 kids in my class, if you know, 66% of you, you know, 30. I love that. That is a cool. That's a cool quote. It was very unmotivating when teachers were handholding. Absolutely, it was. I like that. Thank you. Um, so the idea here is that you would turn and you would have um, you would have different elements uh, of points, and you would say, okay, so sixty six percent of the kids passed the test, and um, yeah, sometimes that works. As it's funny how it works, eh, Jennifer? Um, and what would, sorry, I'm all over the place. Normally I'm a much smoother presenter, but I'm trying to do like the chat and the thing at the same time. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, you can do group incentives. So I say, if, if 66% of the kids kill the monsters, then you all get 250 gold. Well, then what does that happen? You will hear kids in the hallway. Did you study? Are you ready? They're quizzing each other. They're working because they all want that prize and they're going to work collectively. And the strong can motivate the weak, so to speak. I don't like those terms, but exactly. Uh, what it is, right? You have your ch- kids who are more comfortable and high achieving can help motivate. Again, I have a video on my YouTube channel about how I do this because I've moved away from the heart system into a health-based system for your ca- individual characters. I've got the battle board. The most questions I get is about what the heck is this? This is the original battle board. It was in, a, and I, I go through this in detail in book number two, um, insert coin to continue. But in essence, what this is, is this is This is an interactive board game where the kids take little action figures and move around the board and battle each other. Um, So um, what they do is they roll, they move along, they, you know, encounter this little creature here. So for example, you know, this little guy is right here. You know, they roll a six, use a six inch ruler. That's my movement. Every uh, number on a dice is an inch on a ruler. You know, and they, there's my arrow, you know, they move six inches this way, rolls again, you know, two that way, five this way, whatever. He gets to this little guy. And then, yeah, that's awesome. That's exactly right, Dalton. It, it's cool. And again, there's nothing wrong with redoing, right? Like redoing is a cool, is a, is a cool thing because who are we, I love the quote, who are we as the gatekeeper of learning to say learning is on Monday to Thursday and then no more learning that subject anymore. We're doing a new learning on Friday. You know, sometimes kids move at their own pace. Um, so again, you roll, you move and you have interactive side quests. So I might not be able to cover and assess every single topic um, that I want to do, um, but I can add bonus things like, you know, go here and create this or answer this question or solve this problem or design this lever or whatever in order to pick and choose, uh, you know, extra elements to go deeper into the curriculum. Yeah, and see, Joanne, I like that you said that. I find there's no real consequence for kids. So what kids associate is is that loss and avoidance core driver of death. Well, I don't want to die because what happens in my game when you die is I take your inventory of items and I take, I have, I use a percentage dice. I think I actually have dice right here. So 
Um, uh, you know, I said tinfoil is really important. Um, a set of D and D dice. I'll kind of move my camera down. Mm -hmm. uh, of Dungeons and Dragons dice for a few bucks is really really powerful tool for your classroom. You can do math, odds, statistics, um, so many different things. But I have this dice right here, which is a percentage dice. So what it does is it's got different percentages. So when they die, I take all of their items and then they roll. And let's say they get 80, I take 80% of their gold or 60% of their gold. So what you do is you add that chance. So it's, you don't lose everything, but there's that fear of how much am I gonna lose? And then when they die, uh, a total loophole, a, a disruptor type kid realized when their health was low, they would die by sacrificing, they would fail an assignment on purpose or you know take all the damage in a battle for their group. And then they would die on purpose they have given the um, teammate all of their money and all of their cards, they died, and then they came, came back to max health. And I was like, crap, that's a super smart move by kids. So what I did was I said, okay, when you die now, if you had 30 health to begin with, you roll the percentage dice. And if you roll 10%, that means you only come back with 3% health, 10% of 30. There's a math connection, there's a math curriculum. So kids started to do with math in their head and say, is me dying right now worth the effort or the risk of potentially not getting enough health back when I rejuvenate or should I work hard to get a health potion which I know will rejuvenate my health so dice are a massive component of my classroom for that cross-curricular approach um what else do we got here we got more shots of the battle board um that's what it looks like now I started building my own stuff I started just finding YouTube channels and videos about how to build I want to be really clear about something. I am the single worst person at art and craft in existence of human history. And if I am capable of doing things like this, you are too. Trust me. So if you look at, for example, like these, those are branches that you put in a pencil sharpener and you get old looking posts. Like, you know, you glue them all together uh, with, with hot glue and you stick a green cloth on the bottom. Boom, you got like sticks. It, it's so fun. Like I'm actually a giant nerd for it now. I love building. Um, I love the concept um, of choose your own adventure. So when it comes to questing, sometimes that phys ed in me brings it back to life. Um, so choose your own adventure. I have a whole YouTube video about it, but it allows you to, so the kids start here and they read and it says, do they want to go north or south? They get a different task based on north and south. And then they have, you can proceed on the path where you see a path, you go down here. Do you go there? Do you go here? Whatever. And again, this element of choice brings the lack of autonomy and creativity that kids feel out and brings that choice in for kids. This is my favorite quest I do every year, bar none. Many, uh, some of you may have seen it on my YouTube or Instagram or, or anything like that. I simulate a lighthouse. So I say you, you're at a port side city, you see the light, the light is burnt out and you see a ship in the distance and it's gonna crash. Oh yeah, 3D printer is massive if you can get access to them for sure. Um, so they have to solve a puzzle. They don't know that, okay? But I didn't like saying, oh, you gotta go to the lighthouse and save it. So when the kids are ready and they wanna attempt this quest, I, I have a staircase in my school. So I make them run up and down the staircase for one minute as hard as they can, you know, um, to the best of their ability. And after the one minute, that simulates the fatigue you would have. Then when they're done, they spin around for 10 seconds because a lighthouse is a tight spiral staircase that would make you very dizzy going up and very tired. Then when they're, they do both of those elements, I just dump a puzzle on the table and I say, boom, you got to solve this two minutes, 30 seconds, go. And I just stand back and they have to figure out what to do in order to get the light bulb and save the light. This is, kids adore this because no one, no guild on their first attempt has ever done it because they, it, it is, it's challenging, it's difficult and it is so motivating for kids. And the little element of just running and spinning and the things that bring the actual scenario you're doing to life really motivate kids. Um, I teach about like, oh, this is what my, okay, to show you prog progress, okay? This is the original choose your own adventure. This was three years later. Don't be afraid to start with something simple and then progress your way up. A lot of the examples I'm showing are reflective of years of work, okay? And trial and error and, you know, good, bad and ugly and, and student input and feedback. So 
please don't walk away feeling intimidated like, oh, I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that. A hundred percent you can. The idea is just really simple. Um, start something small and then build it up. So I also teach about light. Well, what better way to teach kids about light than by taking it away? So they have to work in the dark in my classroom um, during our light unit and they have to use candles and they have to ration their candles and they have to learn how to use reflection and refraction in order to maximize the, the limited light sources that they have. Um, so, you know, I have little, um, I have actual candles when I'm feeling brave. If I trust the kids, I have little, um, you know, electronic tea lights that they can use. And you should see the incredible ways that kids figure out to magnify light. They start bringing in mirrors and like reflective surfaces and they're like cocooning to trap. The, it's just unbelievable. And none of it is taught, but every part of it is tied to my light curriculum. Um, here's another way I brought a quest to life. I'm just going to pause this. Um, I want you to kind of see what's going on here. There's my addiction, Tim Hortons. Um, so what happened here is uh, kids had to build a claw. We were talking about adapt adaptations. So they had to build a claw. So these kids are in grade seven. This was the one year I taught grade seven science gamified. And what they did was they, they were all given the same exact materials and the same exact time. And they had to build a claw that could pick up a popcorn kernel, uh, a grain of rice, um, a large seed, you know, a couple, a uh, stick, a piece of straw, something like that. I can't remember right off the top of my head because the, I wanted to show them how different claws um, were, were used by different birds um, for different, you know, survival and food, things like that. But then I wanted to put the claw to the test. So I made them run an obstacle course of jumping, of running, of spinning around, of twisting. And then randomly I would throw dodgeballs at them in my classroom because I'm a savage uh, about like another predator attacking them. So they had to protect it. And they had to pick up the kernel from the back here and run the obstacle course and put it in the front of the room. So I want you to watch. So they're going right now and it's a relay. So they go and then they pass the, their claw to their next teammate. What's happening in the background here is the kids are determining who picks up what. These kids are waiting for their turn to go. It's a timed race. These kids are strategizing. It's incredible what happened when we did this. It was a ton of fun. So again, you can see there's the different things uh, that they're going through. So these are just different ways. Bring quests to life. If you say you're here or there or doing this or doing that, don't be a first, sorry, I need a quarantine haircut. My hair is just so dry and like bothering me. I keep looking with my hat. Um, so it's just an incredible way. Uh, bring them to life to the best of your ability. If it's, the quest says you're outside and you can go outside, go outside. If the quest says you're running, make them run in some way. If the quest says it's in the dark, turn the lights off. Like those are the elements that captivate kids and make it an experience that they're just hooked on. Now, when it comes, to, I have an entire 45 minute video on my YouTube about um, um, blah, 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 brain work about making game cards. Okay. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time, but you want to exploring things, taking risks, working as a team, defeating monsters, solving things, you know, all of those different kinds of elements. And then the way I design cards is I thought like a teacher and I thought like a game designer. And then I thought like a kid. So I wanted things that kids could access in my class. So like, you know, our school, like most schools says, uh, you know, shouldn't wear your hat in class policy. Well, if you get thinking cap, you can wear your hat in my class for a week, but my class only just to keep things fair. Strategy session allows you to work as a team on a test for one minute, which, which is chaos at best, which is the funniest thing in the world. Um, I, it just kills me, just kills me. But yeah, um, you give them a minute to go discuss a test as a guild, they get nothing done because they're like, oh my God, what'd you, what'd you get for this? Blah, blah. And then the second time they use the card without any instruction, they realize that every kid needs to stop talking and someone's got to be like, okay, one, I got this, two, I got this. But by the time a minute happens and it's sorted, nothing, nothing gets accomplished, but it teaches them some skills um, about group work. You can have XP or modification uh, or grade things. So you can steal XP from people um, and things like that. You can modify things like changing your name, blowing up items before kids can use them. 
Um, you can attack and defend each other during battle boards or, you know, there's so many things. And this is all outlined in my books and all outlined on the um, card creating video that I have. I think it's called the ultimate guide to card creation. Um, then I had the crafting element. I went with the Minecraft, you know, taking elements to build things. So, you know, this is considered a, a legendary card because you can burn 500 XP off of somebody and knock them down the leaderboard. Um, well, that's hard to get. Well, for kids who feel like they can never attempt to get that card, well, they can actually put it together. So um, if you go onto my website, I'm going to just see if I can. Oh, I can't do that just yet. Anyway, if you go onto my website under the gamification tab, you're going to see crafting shop. Um, somebody built me an online crafting store, super generous guy who heard about this and wanted to contribute. Um, where you can actually punch in the different elements and say, you know, I have two dragon eye, one glowstone, one lumber, what can I make? And it shows you what you can craft. So you have the ability of earning basic resources to create big ones, and then the ability of uh, creating um, uh, or just being able to purchase larger scale ones if you have the resources to do it. Then you can start getting to rare, mythic rare, legendary, un, you know, using different language. So uh, I have the hand of God, which allows you to bring a player back to life once they die with no penalty, as long as it's used within 15 minutes of them paying, uh, of them um, dying. I have the invisibility cloak, which is the, this is my favorite gamification story ever. Invisibility cloak was a card that allowed you to walk around, and this ties with the light and optics unit, because one of the challenges, they have to bend light to create an invisibility wall. Um, it allows you to walk around and peek at people's tests. So I'm going to tell you the greatest way that a kid stuck it to another kid. A kid got this card and he was so proud. He's like, I'm not even going to study. I'm just going to go copy this kid. And he tried to make it super obvious. So obviously this student who was going to get copied from knew this. So what they were doing was they were answering all the questions on the test and the kid goes, this really cloak using it. And he like, you know, he's all smug and he gets up and he walks over to this, to this girl. And he starts, you know, a, B, blah, blah, blah. And he starts copying all the answers. And I say, oh, minute's over. We can all see you go sit down. So he sits down and he's like, <laughs> look at this, I'm so smart. And then the girl does this in front of everyone. She turns and she goes, I just want you to watch what I'm going to do, okay? And I said, hey, don't talk during the test. And then I was, she takes an eraser out. She erases every single answer that he copied. And she did this. She answered on a set on the back of the test the order that she wanted. She put fake answers on the test, knowing that she was going to get copied from, not wanting to get taken advantage of, and stuck it to the kid by the kid copying all her answers. Well, this kid loses it, freak. What did man? Oh, and she's like, you probably should have studied and not relied on cheating. That's on you, not on me. And then just turn around and then just kept taking the test. And this kid was rattled. And it was this, it is again, one of those legendary stories of the gamification program where the kids know you better be prepped and ready for how you use certain items because there are people who know how to counter them. And I, that's one of my favorite stories uh, when it occurred was just m like mind blowing. It was such a cool lesson for kids that, you know, there's always a risk reward in using certain things in a game. You know, you don't get something, something for nothing. Um, then I started using specific cards for battle. So adding points to sneak wins games, stealing questions, blocking, like it's just, again, all of these are, are outlined um, in my book uh, to give you different ideas. And they're all in the Google Drive folder you can download from my website as well. Every single card and explanation is in there. I'm just trying to be mindful of time now because holy smokes, it's been almost two and a half hours. Um, so then we have our guild battles, those foster teamwork, promote growth, they add fun, promote learning, you know, I just want you to watch the excitement here. So someone if you remember from earlier, I would say about 85% are one use only. Um, It could be used for anything. It can also use it on the battle board to like make your character invisible and sneak past an enemy. Um, so it depends on, I always try to have multiple uses, even though most of my cards are one use only. I try to have multiple uses for each card. Um, so here they have to pull the brick and just watch the intensity of the kids as this happens. Like this girl's not even gonna make it. 
So this is the guide. This is the hand. And the fun result is uh, she actually ended up doing it, which is okay. Um, these are just pictures like I use pie face. Um, again, just like look at the kids, right? You have to earn points, but then spend your points to try to pie a team. If you pie them, they learn, they lose a percentage again, using the percentage dice, they lose a percentage of their score. Um, but if they don't get pied, then you just wasted your points. So it's kind of, again, risk reward, give and take. I have jobs. So again, this becomes very difficult to run if you try to do it all on your own. Um, yeah, that's my card, Dalton, for that is called Fire and Ice. You can have where they can ask someone for help, but you better be specific in who you ask because they don't have to be truthful. Um, so I have jobs for kids because, so I needed kids to help me cut out cards, make cards, um, you know, all those different kinds of things, uh, which again, alleviates and saves me a lot of time because, you know, with all the multitude of things going on in the first couple of years as I set up, it was awesome to hire janitors that worked and cleaned my class and organized my shops and, you know, decorated my room and came up with ideas. It was awesome to have that kind of stuff. And to do that, they actually have to submit resumes and job and have job interviews because I'm prepping them for real world work. But at the same time, I don't just want to give jobs to anybody. I want kids to go through the steps so that I know they want to be working and doing, you know, doing what I ask of them. Um, and then they have bank accounts and they have um, money. So I pay them 500 gold a month and then they have performance bonuses. You know, so if my class is spotless, amazing, kids do a great job as the, as the, the custodians of the class, well, then they turn around and they get a performance bonus. If they're terrible at their job and never show up in the rooms always messy, well, then I'll fire them just like in real life. So kids love that. Um, so jobs, they can run shops, they can design your class and help decorate. Um, this is the story of my classroom jail, which is just a story for another day. It's such a riot. Um, you can have, again, these are just other elements to start including now. Um, my bank accounts are just a spreadsheet tab that I use through my app. And then um, I'll show you guys the app in a little bit. Yeah, and that's cool. That's a great idea, Bobby. You can create different jobs for, for your class dependent on you know whatever you have in your class. Um, so I have, I have the leaderboard thing, which I had talked to you guys about before. I have um, achievements and badges. So you can earn badges. So for example, you hand an assignment in early, you get the early bird badge, you know, you go above and beyond with research. So you, you, you know, you include more than is needed, you get the geek it up badge, those kinds of things. I have not tried the concept of a manager, but I will tell you right now, that sounds like a genius idea, Tessa, and I will be stealing it. <laughs> yeah, Lauren, sometimes it's the simple things. And the cool part is you will find that kids will take better care of the classroom and the resources when they are part of creating it because they don't want their hard work in order to, um, get destroyed or ruined so they'll actually police the classroom like you know how long i spent making that put that down and that like and kids respond best peer to peer so it's it's a really cool um um thing that that again worked way better than i thought it would um but tessa i am totally stealing managers that's a love i love that idea here's the trick when giving badges reward authentic behavior that you expect and don't tell them how to get it so don't be like you'll get a badge if You'll get a badge if, because um, when you look at it, kids are not doing it for the right reason. So like, you're going to get a badge um, as people, uh, if, if you help somebody, well, then all the kids are going to go out of their way helping each other. And it's not going to be authentic, genuine behavior. You want to reward authentic, genuine behavior. Um, that is a fantastic idea about upgrading. Like again, see, that's a gamified piece in a gamified classroom a leveling system in the class. So you can be like the barbarian in the classroom doing whatever with your group, but then you can, yeah, you can work and be an apprentice and then, you know, you're super good. So now you're in charge of all the custodians or all the, you know, bank officers or whatever. So that, that's super cool. See, this is why I love this. There's always something to learn in gamification. It is, it is, it is the, the never ending well of idea. Thank you. 
Um, let me just kind of wrap up here. Um, I do something called a random event. This tool is built directly in my classroom. It is a goofy way I start Mondays, the first Monday of a class. Um, they spin this and it's a random thing. Um, you know, it's, it's sad to say like drinking games were an idea. Um, but what you look for is, you know, like silly games, like rhyming games, kindergarten games, dice games, or just totally stupid, ridiculous games um, that you do. And you award gold prizes or XP. This allows kids to get the hero status. So they might not be the best at trivia, but they're incredibly creative. So you might have a 30 second lip sync battle where the, the kids have to do like a goofy lip sync battle. Um, oh, sorry, I just got to respond to something. And, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with anything, but it's a way to just, you know, come into the classroom, have some fun, be goofy and, you know, let kids be kids, burn off some steam. Um, and then you kind of go from there. Yeah, like, so like I view sevens as a math game, you know, counting up to seven, changing the direction on seven number multiples of seven. I've used, uh, you know, rhyme time. I've used two truths and a lie, I've, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, cat's meow means you have to say meow. I got that from Super Trooper. It was one of my favorite movies. So instead of meow, uh, instead of now, you have to say meow, or you can play it where at the end of everything, you have to say meow. Um, broken radios, so you have to pretend you're on a radio. So I'd be like, Roger, you know, uh, the answer to the question is seven, over. And if you don't say Roger at the beginning and over, it doesn't count. Um, the great moo off is literally a kid's idea. He's like, I just want to move as loud and long as I can. So I pick four people and they all move and we time them. And then whoever did it the longest, making an audible sound, one. They're nonsense and stupid, but kids adore them. They take, you know, two, three minutes to run at the beginning of your class. And it sets the tone of just nice, calm, relaxed fun for the week. Um, again, my wheel is on my classroom. If you have questions about my games, please do let me know. They're all built by uh, on this website, classtools.net. Um, these are some of my ideas that I've seen floating around the gamification universe, which is cool. Uh, one kid was like, if I, if I kill a monster, doesn't it drop loot? And I was like, uh oh, uh, yes, give me a minute. So I went home and I came up with the idea of scratch tickets. I use the website myscratchoffs.com and I, I buy scratch off paper. Um, there's tutorials online if you're crafty about how to make your own from paint and glue, I think it is, and some sort of other liquid. Um, and then I have, again, I have a tutorial about how to make these, but essentially take cardstock, print a template, put the sticker on, print over the sticker, and then scratch. So, you know, you find 75 gold or you find nothing or whatever. For me, they're literally just for fun. They're not, uh, they're not a connection, curriculum connection piece, but they could be. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? It's a way, you know, Monday's a drag for a lot of people. It's a way to just get the kids in and be excited and, you know, have fun with that kind of stuff. Um, I have the give sub superpowers, obviously coming in for a substitute teacher is a bit challenging. I have consistent ones that know my program, but I give these, I have a little envelope on my desk for subs. They're called soul stones. The only student or the only person I can give these away are, stu are uh, student uh, blah, blah, substitute teachers. And when I have a substitute teacher, they, yes, that's what it is, dish soap and paint. Thank you, Bobby. Um, the idea is what happens, uh, they take the best performing team that works the best, is on task, whatever the criteria is, and they give them a soul stone. And then the goal is to earn three soul stones of different colors. And then you can go to a special area where instead of scratch offs like this, I found holographic diamonds on that myscratchoff.com. And then, yeah, exactly. So like, again, there's so many inexpensive ways to do it. Like, and again, let your creativity flag fly, as I like to say, like you can kind of do anything and everything that you'd like. Um, so, you know, we kind of go from there about how that works itself out. Um, just looking through, looking through. Um, Oh yeah. And then um, you have to have different colors. The kids don't know that. And then they scratch off this diamond and then the diamond um, has a, a huge money value, but it's either a real diamond or a fake diamond. If it's a real diamond, it's worth a thousand gold. You get a thousand gold split however you want with your team. If it's a fake, you only get 10%. So there's a little math connection there too. Um, and then they have the curse card so they can poison kids who are being uh, goofballs and not paying attention. And then they have to answer me and I have riddles. I bought, I found for five bucks at Walmart, I found a tin of riddles uh, and pictogram puzzles. So then I give the kids the puzzles and riddles and they solve them within 24 hours or the poison kills them or I give them the antidote. So again, goofing around, I have character classes and this is a wicked, wicked conversation about sexism in video games and in cart and comics. Um, 
so you can become a mage, a thief, a priest, a barbarian, a steampunk, a scout. Um, there's one more I'm missing. Uh, anyway, it's all in the book. Um, so I, I find a picture and I use MTG Cardsmith. Again, all broken down in my, my card making video on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> and then you find an image, you create the things. How I work it is here's the story and your two starter cards as that character. But check this out. I Googled male mage or, or you know, heretic or whatever kind of, you know, magical kind of creator. Look, I got cool pictures like this. I search women. I always get the battle bra armor and the overtly chesty and not well and, you know, that kind of thing. And it's a wicked discussion to have with kids about, you know, why the heck does the knight look like this for a dude, but the girls look like this. So it's a wicked thing about being aware um, I'd have to find them, Jordan, to remind myself. I can't remember, but they were where they keep all the dice and games. They were just a, a you literally a circle tan about the size of the coffee mug, and it, there was all kinds of different puzzles and riddles in them in the game section. And it was uh, it was hanging because it's just a little cardboard package. Um, so again, this is I, I I'm a big proponent of, of this and and teaching kids. You know, watch how you how certain things are perceived in the world, and how can we try to change those things and, and so yeah, I like that kind of topic. It's a great discussion piece. It's really eye-opening for kids. And then that leads to my skill systems. Um, I have a skill system where you roll a 10-sided dice and based on your level, um, you can level up. So this is really motivating for kids. They like the idea of you know, every certain amount of um, percentage you get on a test or an assignment, or you can find books that you pick up as item that teach you skills. So um, you attack, defense, explore, chance, they're all broken down here. You know, better odds of finding loot, better odds of climbing things. Um, and this came from, I'm going to scroll way back real quick. In the battle board, there was different terrain that kids could cross. And without climbing and without swimming and all kinds of things, kids were just plowing through everything too fast. So I was like, crap, every, everybody can swim. Then putting an element is just now a race to who can get there first. But now with swimming, if you get there and you don't have high enough swimming, so for example, I'll show you this uh, character right here, this priest class has zero swimming ability to start with. So if you get to a, a pool of water and want to, and want to, that's a good idea, Alistair. Yeah, totally. AR is so fun. Um, using swimming you have the ability to um make it so that they get there but then they can't swim so you know they they fail and they take damage they almost drown or you know get hurt in the water or whatever so then i just have a level system if you're level one you got a 33 percent chance of level one to three level four four to six level seven that's a typo there whoopsie level seven is 90 percent. level 10 you can swim but then kids started to go in groups and they were like, okay, I'll max out swimming, I'll max out chance, I'll max out climbing. So we've come to a decision, my battle, cause this was the first year I did skill sheets. Next year, I'm gonna change the skills so that there's never a hundred percent. There's always a risk of missing just so that it keeps that excitement. Um, my language teachers to, keep, to teach kids about ELL uh, an English language learner and how hard it is to, to come to another country and learn a different language and things like that what I did was I created three different languages. So you might meet an orc on the battle board who talks to you in orcish and you don't understand them. And then if you have a little bit, you understand keywords. If you have a, a little bit more, you understand more. And if you can understand orc, then you can have a conversation. So when you, um, so I'll often take like, you know, a, a narrative piece, you know, the orc shouts and I'll just type it in random gibberish numbers or wingdings or random fonts. And then if they have like level one to three, so they have beginner orc, I'll just give them keywords in English or whatever your native language is where you're teaching. Um, and I'll say, okay, you know, you don't understand anything but the following words, death, save and fight. So now what do you do? What do you think he means? Do you think that this character wants you to help save him? Does he want to fight you? Oh, by the way, you got 10 seconds. He's really mad. And they're like forced choice upon kid, which is really fun. And I love being kind of a little mischievous like that, um, you know, dodging attacks. And then when it comes to technology, I mentioned this earlier, if you're in the medieval times, 
you don't understand what a computer is. So you have to earn the ability to use technology in my classroom and you have to level up your technology skills. So if you remember, I went to these character classes at the beginning of this, of the year, each character class receives a skill sheet to begin with, with the following that's on one side, the explanations. And then on this side is the skills that they can learn. Obviously these skills can be anything you want. Um, you can customize them to your own game. And then I give them 12 starter points. So I said a priest has two in defense, one in exploration, definitely lots with the undead, you know, a couple language things, dodge. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second, Alistair. Um, so as we look at all of this, they also have what's called a passive skill and an active skill. A passive skill means all the time. So that means if they're in a fight against an undead, like a skeleton or a, a ghost, they have plus three attack because they're a priest and they should they can control the bad things that are undead and devilish and things like that um, better. That's their advantage. And then they, at one point, they are the only people who are allowed to use the hand of God. They are the only people who can use that card to bring back a, a player to life. So if you get that card and you're not a priest and you have no priest in your guild, well, that becomes a useless card and then a huge trading piece to another group. Um, if you're a barbarian, obviously your attack and your climbing and stuff is going to be higher because you're more of an explorer. It's going to be a bonehead in magic and technology and luck because you're just kind of like the brute to go in and battle everybody. Now to go back to what Alistair said about when your health dies, I take all of your items from your inventory and I take a percentage based on a percentage dice of your gold from you. Um, and then I take you come back to life with a percentage of your health. And on the topic of health, each character class actually has a different level of starting health, which is kind of cool. So, you know, a barbarian starts with, with 60, but a priest who's, you know, not exactly known for being a warrior and in battle only starts with 30. And kids don't know this till they take their character class. I even gamified my parent teacher interviews um, where parents could come in, answer some trivia questions and um, earn points and rewards for their kids. Um, I dim the lights, you know, I sit on my throne, I've got candles, you know, I make it because a lot of parents go, what the heck do you do in this room? I just don't understand. So I use this as a way to kind of show parents what it's like because I make them answer a question and then roll and then try to double or nothing. And then the, the kids are like dying inside because they want to answer the questions. The parents want to risk. It's, it's fun. It's really cool. Um, and that is a pumpkin with my face. A parent gave that to me as a gift. It is the coolest thing I've ever received. Look at that. Um, I do simulation. So I had a bunch of kids who are interested in the medical careers. These kids are in grade 11 now. It's funny to see them now. They're all tiny. And uh, what happens here? is I, I want, they wanted to learn about human anatomy. So I built corpses with actual organs, like sheep and cow organs. And then I, I used jello uh, and like a ballistics gel. Um, well, not ballistic. I just used a thicker jello and I put blood vessels and blood packets. And I essentially let them do an autopsy to, to find out why this character died. And it's funny that they're in pie dishes because I thought when I built my body, it fit inside this big fridge we had at the school but it didn't. So I had to cut the body into uh, um, what did I do? I cut the body into pie pieces and shapes and actually like, cause I couldn't store it for the jello to solidify. So I said, you found the, the body in, in pieces and in corpses or sorry, in chunks. So they had to do an autopsy. They had to cut it open. I turned my class into a morgue. Um, they had to determine a cause of death. And these kids at 13 years old found the clot I put in the brain and said that the, he died of a stroke, which is again, no, I didn't do anything. They figured all of that out on their own, which is cool. They even brought in their own scrubs, which was hilarious. You know, they were wearing scrubs and stuff. It's just so neat. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I mean, there's so many different elements in the class. I even had a game in this. If you were paying attention, I had different colored letters. And if you read all of the red letters, said you can make a difference, make school fun. We call those Easter eggs. So hidden in plain sight that you don't know about. Um, anyway, that, that is my presentation. Um, holy smokes, it's been three hours. Whoa. So I played it one time. And I loved it. And I want to play it more. Uh, Warhammer was kind of cool.
Um, so it would be lovely if you want to join our online community by by tagging stuff with the hashtag game my class, please uh, join me on Twitter and Instagram. Um, email me, I will contact you. Um, I will help you out to the best of my ability. Um, please follow and, and kind of share the Master Heaves YouTube channel um, where I'm going to continue to do this. This video will be up there later today once it uh, auto uploads, once the meeting is complete. Um, and I do want to give you guys all a $50 gift. That is three free months, if you write that down, of Pear Deck Premium. I'm uh, what's called a Pear Deck Coach. Um, and I, I can give this away so people can use Pear Deck. So take that uh, bit.ly URL down and then you'll get 50, uh, three free months. I wouldn't activate it now because going into the summer, but maybe activate it in mid August um, or early August, depending when you return back to school and, and kind of go from there. Um, before I end is, is there any kind of like burning questions? I know this was a incredible amount um, of information that I just threw at you over these hours. I mean, I went an hour longer, but that's just because I wanted to make sure I was answering the questions in real time. Um, or is, you know, the book, Press Start to Begin, is essentially this presentation in a linear fashion. The book is even gamified um, and things like that. So uh, yes, I do. So I do intend, if, if people really like this, you know, maybe on Fridays or I don't know, whatever day we, we work, I have no issue going with specific topics that people, you know, have more questions about. I can literally build and create things with you in real time. Um, I, I'm totally open to that. I absolutely adore this stuff. I love presenting and sharing and, and helping teachers um, because I've had a lot of fun and success and, and I'm happy to do that with other people. Yeah, Lauren, and that's a really great point. It can feel really alone if people are like judgy and like, oh, why would you do that and, and stuff. But if you if you get on to um, where is my proper thing? Where's screen two? This one. If if I were to go here and kind of share this, this is the if you never use tweet deck, it's a uh, it's wicked, um, but you can use TweetDeck in order to just make it sure that it's showing up here. I'm just checking my feed. Is it working? Yay, okay. So um, when you go here, use TweetDeck and sign up and then put your username and then the different hashtags you wanna follow. So I can always see when people are kind of tweeting um, and asking questions. <clears throat> um, you can share ideas here. I mean, this community is amazing. This little game, my class community that we have, um, they are super supportive and they have so many awesome ideas and they're so willing to share and, and help each other. So that's one that I would follow and that I'd highly recommend for sure um, is, is really good for your little growth there. Just looking here. Okay, yeah, so I guess that, that's about all I got planned for today. Um, like I said, I know I threw a ton at you. My, my recommendation would be um, reading that first book. And as you go through it, um, it will kind of align. It'll ask you questions. The book is interactive. The book is a choose your own adventure. It's gamified. Um, everything that I could do to kind of build the, uh, the, the thought process, help you kind of through it, how it all works. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for, for enduring three straight hours of me talking. Um, that was wild, but I loved it. I love this stuff. This is unexpectedly become my biggest passion in education. It's just a different way of thinking and challenging the norm. So thank you all for joining me. Um, I had a blast talking with you guys. You guys are amazing, awesome questions and things like that. So um Feel free to connect with each other through social media, Twitter, email, whatever works best for you. Um, that game, my class hashtag, you know, just check your name. Hey, you know, I'm new to this. I, I do, you know, 
E, ELA, you know, grade five to eight, you know, anyone out there, there's somebody out there for sure. I haven't quite cracked the student base grading just yet, but how essentially, um, oops, not the chat. Um, this is how I do it. Um, every month, and forgive the sloppiness. Every month, kids are shooting for an, a total, oops, that's an ugly one, are shooting for a total of 1500 XP. That's what they want. This in my grade book is going to equal 100%. Okay. To create natural scaffolding and to create, um, uh, the, the ability for kids to risk take, I give 2000 XP worth of assignments each month. This allows and gives kids a safety net because they can try a variety of things in order to attain that hundred percent. So that means to get a hundred percent, you don't have to get a hundred percent to get a hundred percent. You have to actually get in and around that 75% mark, but why this works is because it creates a safety net for kids to not be worried about what it is they're going to do and what there is they're going to try. It increases more risk taking. Then how you calculate the percentage, let's say at the end of a month, a kid gets, you know, 1200. I'm actually going to use a number I can do math on. Let's say they earn a thousand XP out of 1500. Well, what you do is you just divide this the same way you'd get a test score and that would give you 66%. This is what would be their grade. It's broken down like this. So if a parent goes, how did they get 66%? I can say, well, they did three assignments. Assignment one, they got 200. Assignment three, they got 400. And then assignment, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. There we go, 400. So then they have 800, they had a thousand. So the individual things are all marked, but pooled together and then divided. Now for standard base grading, I am not entirely sure how you would get that to work. Um, we haven't shifted to standard base grading, but that is something that I'm sure there are people far smarter than me who have already cracked that code. Um, but that's, I hope that makes sense. So then if a kid gets like 1800 XP, will they get a hundred percent? The incentive of going over is that the grade goes in their grade book, but this goes into the leaderboard. So if you, you know, earlier I mentioned there was a card called Purge that pulls 500 XP from somebody. Well, what occurs there is that if you have 1800 XP in the leaderboard, you pull 500, you knock them down to 13, but it doesn't affect their grade because you could never justify as a teacher, a kid's ability to steal their marks. So um, this is a way for those competitive kids and disruptors to mess up the game but those cards are hard to come by. So they end up having to work hard to mess with other people, but they don't see it that way. So it's all about, I mean, look at this. What the heck did I draw here? This big mess of something, but that's what teaching looks like. Yeah, I am totally down for doing more of these. Absolutely. Um, I am more than happy to, like I said, I love this. I'm so keen to participate. Yeah. I believe, yeah, Matera does, and I believe Adam Powley does as well. He has a wicked blog um, to check out. Oh yeah, I always say one of the things I present about is, is, is education makes things unnecessarily complicated. So <laughs> I try to keep it as smooth as possible because I'm a simple-minded person. As many as I want, and you can add and take them away as much as you want. So you can even use the, um, the timed, oh my God, I'm, why am I blanking on my own presentation? The, uh, oh my goodness, now I gotta go look it up. Give me a second. Do, 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 do. Autalysis, uh, scarcity, there it is, scarcity and impatience. You can even use that um, model and by saying, you know, it's a wandering traveler shows up, he's only there for four days, you gotta get to him and then he disappears. 
as to where you might have an orc standing in front of the same fire for the 10 months of your school year. So you can add and take away as many as your class um, needs. So a lot of the things that I do are reflective of my own class. So this is kind of the skeleton about how to do it. And then, you know, you add the meat, as I like to say to it, you populate it um, based on how your, your classroom would view, would look um, and feel, you know, you might want more, you might want less, you know, whatever the case may be, but that's a good question. That's what I like about creating my own and not using prefab tools is that you have much more control over your game um, and can really ride the ebbs and flows about what's working, what's not working um, in your own class. Okay, well, how about this? Let's, uh, let's wrap it up there for today. Um, I got my own <laughs> kind of school job I got to hop on back to now that I've done my, my stuff for the morning here. Um, but thank you so much for, for coming and participating and sharing the information. Um, I will post the video online if you ever want to come back and check out bits and pieces of it. Um, it'll probably take a couple hours to upload, I would imagine, for sure, because I've never done one this long. Um, but I will put it online and then people can check it out at their leisure. Please feel free to share it with anybody. Um, and thank you for joining me. That was spectacular. I had a blast. Um, really enjoyed that. And yeah, thanks for coming. And I will definitely, if the need is there and the interest is there, I'll definitely have more of these uh, sessions about whatever topics it is that uh, you would like me to cover. And I will go from there. So as I always do in my videos, thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. And until next time.